Monday Degenerates. Welcome back to the Die Hard MMA podcast right here on the home of fight. We've got UFC Vegas 88 tonight and we are working on getting back on track. Let's get the giant shit stinking elephant out of the room. I'm not supposed to cuss within the first five minutes of the show. Demonetized right off the bat. Second show on the new channel and I've already ruined it. <laughs> We're coming off UFC 299 and uh I feel like I should be wearing the baby blue shirt. I feel like I should have the gold chain necklace with the money on it. We dropped another seven unit bet last week, and I don't mean dropped as in missed. Dropped as in I've only made eight of the things since I started this show. In five years of taking MMA gambling seriously, I've only made eight max bets. We moved to six and two on the max bet record. We hit our best bet. We had a beautiful read on those big chalky favorites. Yes, he had to eat a little bit of chalk. I know people have some problem with that, but it was about as no sweat as you could get. And on top of that, we beat the line move for that parlay by a country mile. It was one that we played at minus 179 and then it closed Upwards of minus 200, you would need to add a third leg to get it down to playable uh, in, in a playable ballpark by the time the fights act actually kicked off. So I'm actually really proud about that. But the thing I'm frustrated about is I still ended up having a losing night last week. Uh, I talked about this, I think, actually on last week's show, that I have started to do better capitalizing on those low-hanging fruit spots, and that's where you make your bread and butter. We can go ahead and stack some easy wins with that if we just keep our eyes open to them and that's why i played the seven unit bet with the parlay last week as big as i did and it cashed and it was beautiful but then i went out there and i threw a whole bunch of other bets at the dartboard and that ended up costing us we could have just smash and grabbed again how many times do i say that on this damn show i'm a degenerate i can't help it i can't help myself i always play way too many spots so we posted an l for last week I posted a record update. We are minus 17 units in the year of our Lord 2024. Three months in, that doesn't feel great. I will be honest with you, though, guys. I kind of thought it was going to be worse. Like, we're minus 17, and you never want to be minus 17. We got a lot of time left to go ahead and correct that. We've got a lot of time to get back on track. You guys know as well as I do, especially if you've been here for more than two months, I swing for the fences. I swing like crazy. We'll have eight weeks in a row where we destroy and then we'll have four or five weeks in a row where I just get the shit kicked out of me. So that's, that's kind of what we do around here. Right? So uh, apologies for the big swings. We're down a little bit to start the year, but we will work on it and we will get it back. That starts now. What's up everybody in the chat. We've got my guy, mushroom M M a Ethan Hershey, you son of a bitch. So Ethan made me a, uh, Ethan made me a little bet last week that Dustin Poirier was going to be the one to win against my guy, Benoit Saint-Denis. And I got to tell you guys, that parlay that I made last week with BSD and Macy Barber, I was sweating the Barber leg. I was convinced I've got my futures ticket on BSD. I've got parlays with BSD. I, I'm like making DJ in last second dart throws at Benoit inside the distance to just pad the bankroll a little bit. Like telling my cousin, bro, if you're going to bet a fight, but this is the, I was never, ever even considered. And I know Dustin Poirier is like a legend. I know he's one of the best in the damn game, right? I, I know this. And I completely wrote him off in that spot. I thought it was such a bad matchup for him, but Ethan challenges me live on the podcast to basically do a shot bet here for this fight. And he picks Dustin freaking Poirier. So on that note, my friend, Ethan, I owe you a shot. 
And I didn't grab the bottle of Fireball because I'm in a bit of a rush today. So I will go get that and I will pay up. I also owe, I believe, two shots from a previous bet that was made back when we were over on Pub Sports Radio. And I was out of Fireball, so I made the bet without the funds. And by the way, with your bookie, you never want to do that. Thankfully, it's just a shot that I owe. No one's breaking my ankles to get me to take those two shots here today. But I'm going to make up for those. So, folks, we got a drunk stream on our hands tonight, apparently. Let me get to the rest of the chat. We've got Gray in the house. My guy, Nuke the house let me give a shout out real quick because i've been telling you guys about nuke he broke the fights down with me for three straight hours on last week's card he actually made a buttload of money off that card and if you've been following him like i told you to they made like 30 units on sunday because he does this insane thing where he finds the soft spots on the ufc card and then he ties it to nascar which everything is like plus 700 or better on nascar so the parlays are outrageous and he just piles monday i call it the sunday bailout because if i have a bad night in mma this man makes my money back for me on sundays so please follow my guy nuke the house he was last week's uh guest so make sure you check him out dixon ciders in the house we've got joe bit the grateful dude nichols the chat is back absolutely david ramirez all right we are getting the ball rolling everybody let's freaking go goalie zero david ramirez dr elijah true boo boo hitman in the house okay okay that is enough preamble First and foremost, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest, one of my personal favorites. You guys know the man. He hops over here every once in a while on the show and hangs out. And I got to tell you guys, I, I am loving this new opportunity here at Home of Fight. This is the new home for the Die Hard MMA podcast. And I love having my guest on the show. But Wheezy and DFS being from pub sports radio with me it always felt a little redundant because they do a show on sunday and then i have one of them on my show on monday so people watching are like bro we just watched this guy we fixed the problem i'm on a different channel now wheezy and brady are coming in with the fresh takes you may not have heard uncle wheezy what's up my guy how you doing tonight I'm doing good, man. Uh, I'm coming off a little bit of a losing week last week. I had a lot of faith in Gileton Almeida. And if Gileton Almeida wins, I'm up like four units. And if he loses, I'm down like four units and I'm down four units. So it was a rough one last week, but we're moving on to this week. And that's one of the great things about doing a show on Sunday nights is you get to celebrate your wins. You get to you get to mourn your losses, but you got to get right back to next week's work. You know, there's really not a lot of time to relax, to wait. We got to get right back into the work, and I've been doing it for this week already. I've already done one show this week, and I'm ready to break down these fights because there's some really fun ones. There's some good matchmaking on this card. This Delgarian uh, um, uh, Rodriguez fight is phenomenal matchmaking. We get to see the return of Mike Davis. He fights about once every two years, and this is the year, you know, so we get to see him. Um, and we got some good young prospects on the card. I think the McKenna. Amarim fight is really yep. good matchmaking. So even though it's not a pay-per-view card with just an absolute stacked lineup of top name fights, this is a fun card with some really good niche matchups that'll be fun to talk about. And hopefully we can find some ways to stack cash tickets like flapjacks on this event. Hell yeah, Weezy. Hell yeah. All right. So real quick. Uh, I want to run over just uh, you know some of some of the things that went wrong for me here last week. First and foremost, shout out to our guy Dixon Sider. You're always repping the only fans fade. I thought the retirement angle was going to be a little bit stronger, but JoJo Wood gets the damn thing done in her retirement fight. Love to see her go out on top. Turns out the only fans fade is King. Uh, already mentioned the uh, seven unit parlay. Asu Almabayev and Robles to Spania came home. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Couldn't have looked any better doing it. I was this close last week, Weezy. This stinking close to adding Michelle Pereira. And then I was actually going to play him by knockout. I called like the body shots and stuff like that. That was a big tool that I felt like he could have used. And he did drop Oleg Sechuk with a body shot, but then grabbed the neck. So like. Yeah. I, you know, another one, that's a that's a kind of feel like I could have, would have, should have on that one. Missed out a little bit. Uh, late, I added the Ion Kuta Laba lens under one and a half, and it goes the full distance naturally when I decide to bet some violence and play a little chalk on it. That doesn't feel great. But if you run that fight back, I mean, shit, they hit each other with some big shots. In that first round, yeah. Kuta Laba's leg looked like it was gone, and then he dropped lens with a big shot. I mean, that's one of those ones where... I put a post out on Twitter asking, like, 
good bet or bad bet. And you, you, people, there's the group of people, which by the way, that poll, it was on a different fight, but it came back damn near 50-50, Wheezy. Like people don't know how to think about that when it comes to betting and odds. A lot of people think good bet, win bet, end of story. There's no such thing as a bad bet if the ticket yeah. cashes. And like to a certain extent, I get the thought process, but we're trying to find like, actual value and identify whether or not we made a mistake this one's hard for me because the under one and a half didn't cash but if you told me that kutalaba dropped lens and you told me that ion could barely stand on one leg i probably bet the under one and a half again you know what i mean so like I i'm having a tough time with that one i'm not sure if i made a mistake or if i should have uh if i'm okay to go ahead and play that one i called the kyler phillips by decision again no bet from me. I, I wanted to see him. I wanted to see if he had, you know, any issues. Usado is a big question here for me on that one. I pulled the trigger on Rafael Dos Anjos, Wheezy. And he looked so good in round one. He looked so good. He won round one on two of the judges' scorecards. We are one and one going into round three. I've got a 14 to one RDA split decision bet in my pocket, and it was going to come home if he had won round three because one judge gave the first round to the wrong guy. So I actually feel like I was in a beautiful position for this Gamrot and RDA spot. Now, obviously, everybody is like, oh my God, bro, you actually bet RDA like, plus 350, guys. Like, I don't understand why people can't wrap their brains around the fact that plus 350, when it's one and one going into the third, I want plus 350 every time, Wheezy. Every single time. And then I had an outside shot at a 14 to one split decision. Come on. I don't care what anybody says. I'll make that same exact bet again if they run that fight back tomorrow. I feel like that was a great bet. Um, already mentioned Macy Barber and Caitlin Chukagian. Um, I had some out of cage concerns about Caitlin Chukagian, but the reality is Macy Barber just looked damn good and did a lot really well in that fight. So felt good to, you know, check off that parlay leg for that one. We already touched just a little bit on Curtis Blades, Jailton Almeida, and uh, you and I were on opposite sides there on that one. That was another one that, man, I felt really good about Curtis Blades as long as he didn't get finished in the first round. And, and those fights, they're so volatile, Wheezy. When you've got a spot where you're like, I know this guy can win, but he's got to get out of the first round. They just pucker my butthole like nothing else. Because it's a 50-50 for four straight minutes, and then your handicap kind of comes into play. And Jailton whooped Blade's ass for a good five straight minutes there. Uh, I was happy to, you know, that my my striking prediction is the thing that came through. He knocked Jailton out in round two. Um, kind of feels good for me because I've been on a bit of a Jailton hater since he got to the UFC. I've been uh, trying to look for opportunities to fade him and extend him. I almost bet Parker Porter just trying to do that shit, so I'm happy Blades got it done for me. I feel vindicated there. And then uh, Song Yudong, man. I I cannot believe the amount of Pyotr Jan fans, Wheezy, because my Instagram notifications are going off. I have not received so many likes and comments on a Instagram picture in my entire life. Now, granted, I did use a sexy picture of Song Yudong showing his abs off during the weight cut. So maybe that has a little something to do with it. I might be thirst trapping Instagram over there. But legitimately, the Yan fans are coming out of the woodwork to like mock me for having dared pick against their boy that was on a three fight skit, even though it was just like a one unit play at the time they're, they're using the old picture before I even doubled down on the play. And I'm just getting relentlessly harassed on Instagram for that one. Absolutely hilarious. Um, definitely a level spot. Definitely a spot where song got shown. He's still young, still got some room to grow. Beautiful comeback fight uh, for Piotr Jan. And, that one's kind of a, um, what do they call it? It's like a process play for me, right? If I get plus money on Song Yudong, I'm, I'm pulling the trigger. End of story. Like that's, that you know, that's kind of all it is for me there in that spot. Um, real quickly, Burns, Jack Della. I'm so mad because I had a big fat bet on the under two and a half wheezy. And if you told me that Burns got the takedowns the way he did, and you told me he got the control time the way he did, I would have thought he would have finished with a sub. And then Jack Della finishing him with a big knee and a big knockout. I felt like that could have happened at any point in time during the fight. But somehow, it squeezes up and over my two and a half rounds. And I end up losing that ticket. So I felt really shitty about that one. Because again, another one that like in hindsight, I probably make the same bet. I probably still feel like it's an okay bet to pull the trigger on. And I got a little unlucky for that thing to squeeze up and over the two and a half. So very frustrating. Um... Bounced back and forth on Holland Page basically all week. Couldn't pick a side. And uh, 
congrats to the page backers. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't have much to say uh, on that one. Not really a great or exciting fight. I already touched on Benoit Saint Denis, Dustin Poirier. That was the nail in the coffin. It could have been like an okay night, not like a horrific loss if Benoit had just come through for me and I had gotten it was like a four and a half unit swing if I hit that parlay. So would have felt a lot better. My butt would have been a little more comfortable today had that been the case, but it is what it is. And then the final shot in the main event, I mean, O'Malley, what am I going to say? It was a masterful performance. They made the right adjustments. He looked beautiful, absolutely gorgeous on the feet. And Vera, I expected him to get going a little bit faster. I know that's always been his thing is to kind of give a round or two away and then turn up. But dear God, like he just never turned up. Now, some of that, I feel like we need to credit to Sean O'Malley and his game plan. We can't just take everything away from him. Uh, but Vera still didn't really have the sense of urgency that I kind of expected him to coming into a rematch like this. So Womp Womp, unfortunately, gave a little bit back there in that spot as well. And that's frustrating because I almost bet the over four and a half. And I said Sean O'Malley by decision is probably the most likely outcome. So I kind of, one of those spots where I kind of called it, but then pulled the wrong trigger yet again. And real funny, I got a guy on Twitter who apparently started plugging my picks into like a spreadsheet when he does his breakdowns. And apparently, uh, he said I'm hitting it like 62%. So I'm actually doing really well with my like predictions and stuff like that. However, I'm making bad bets. And that's why I have these losing weeks. And I'm like, it's funny because, bro, I know. Like, I've been telling everybody on the show for like the last two years that that's what's been happening. I'm like, I know the predictions are good. The thought process are good. The analysis is solid. And I just, for some reason, pulled the wrong freaking triggers. But it's nice to have somebody with actual like documented evidence of that. So it's not just me feeling like a crazy person. That's actually what I'm doing. And someone out there actually proved it. So kind of hilarious kind of stings a little bit and wheezy i'm sorry i haven't let you talk for a good five minutes i wanted to recap last week's card and the betting for everybody listening and what i need to do is pay my debt so i have to go get a bottle of fireball if you would like to discuss last week's card or if there's anything you want to touch on give me two quick minutes and i'll be right back with a bottle but i'm going to kick it off to you while i run grab that real fast yeah, you got it, man. I'll take over here. So I, I lost one unit on Gilton Almeida's money line at plus 105. I lost one unit on Mikhail Oleksiejczyk's money line at plus 120. I thought Oleksiejczyk was going to be able to pressure Pereira and get him on that back foot. And I felt like if he did that, he was going to kind of render him a lot less effective. But th the opposite happened. I mean, he didn't really even pressure that much. And Pereira looked amazing. Um, I had finish only props for both Pedro Munoz and uh, Marlon Vera. They both pushed. I had Kyler Phillips to win by decision at minus 107 for one unit. That hit. I had Chukagian to win by decision. Got that at plus 260 when her money line was plus 175. So even though I was picking Barber to win the fight, I felt like if Caitlin didn't wrestle at all, and just tried to keep the, the fight at distant striking range and kind of picked her apart from a range. I thought she would have we would she would have a chance to win that fight, but she was the one initiating the wrestling. And I was like, oh well, I'm screwed because Caitlin Chukagian couldn't take down a sack of potatoes. Her her takedown accuracy is something like 21%. That was before the barber fight. It was even worse afterwards. So yeah, that wound up not being a great bet. My biggest bet of the night was a two two unit par two yeah two unit parlay, Gilton Almeida, and then the under three and a half rounds for Poirier Saint Denis. And really, what I should have did was just max bet that Poirier Saint Denis uh, under three and a half rounds. That was that was free money. It was my strongest read of the week. But I just hate straight betting stuff that's more than <laughs> minus two hundred because my tough. my thought process is okay. If you like it and it's minus 200 or or worse in terms of implied probability, right? That means you've got to be two-thirds sure. And if you're two-thirds sure, you should either go the full five units or you should stay away from it, right? That's my thought. Because if it's already an implied probability that should be happening seven out of 10 times or so, and you're confident that it happens even more than that, then you should have the, the confidence to max bet it. But as a capper who has to be on YouTube every week accountable to your picks. You don't want to be throwing out max bets every week, you know, uh, especially, you know, for, for volatile fights, something like a Poirier versus St. Denis, you know, but uh, St. Denis got tired after that first round. I'd never seen him get tired before.
Um, that was wild. And then Poirier just landed perfect shots. What a finish. I mean, just absolutely brutal. And, you know, I want to talk about the main event for a second because I would have bet Marlon Vera if I had any proof in his entire UFC career that that dude would ever show urgency, that he would ever start <laughs> walking forward early, yep. that he would ever pressure his opponent and take advantage of his two biggest advantages that he has, conditioning and durability. Because if he went out there from round one and got in Sean's face, because he was going to be able to eat whatever Sean put on him, and he proved that. It's when he got hit with that knee, Clint, that sounded like when Paige broke Evangelista Cyborg's skull. You remember that? I do. And, and you remember that sound, that awful sound? It sounded like somebody dropped a watermelon off the fifth floor of an apartment building. That's what that knee sounded like, you know, when, when Sean landed. She was made Marlin. out of something else, man. Dude, and he ate it. He ate it. And my point was, is like, dude, if he would have just realized, look, this guy's not knocking me out. And he's not in as good a condition as I am. I mean, this guy's running half marathons every Sunday, every every week of the year. Marlon Vera's conditioning is incredible. If he would have just pushed the pace from moment one, I think he would have won that fight. I think he probably would have won it more than five times out of ten. But yeah. we knew. We knew going in that he was going to do jack shit in round one, jack shit in round two. And then he was going to have to go back. And Perillo was going to be like, are you feeling okay, Marlon? This is a title fight. Do you want to start turning it on, Marlon? You know hey, how he does in every damn fight. And so, yep. you know, I was kind of glad that I didn't bet Marlon Vera's money line. And, I, and I'm mad at myself because one of the things I said I was going to do all week was bet Sean O'Malley by decision. Didn't pull the trigger. So I was That's frustrated. That's the worst about feeling that. in gambling, Wheezy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, uh, definitely not my best week. But, you know, if Jarleton doesn't get caught in that spot and he keeps getting takedowns, I'm up four units, and I'm feeling really good about my reads this week. So, but we we move on, man. I'm I'm ready for this week. I think there's some really fun fights. There's already I've already got three bets that I've made, and I'm definitely looking to add on after we chat about these fights here. Yes, sir. All right, we're one down, folks. That's up for Ethan Hershey. Here goes number two. Ethan, congrats on your call on Dustin Poirier, and I believe honestly, I think it was Ethan as well. But I like I said, I owe two back shots. So let me get those here for you real quick. That one's number two. Oh, my God. All right. Clint, and I know then, you hate drinking alone. Do I need to go get a bottle here? Hey, if, if you want to take a shot with me, Wheezy, I will wait for you with this last one. We can I'll definitely right get back. that going. A gentleman doesn't let another host, co-host, uh, drink alone. So I'll be right Friends back. don't let friends drink alone. And, uh, yes, Dixon, empty stomach. Your boy just ran home from work, so I got nothing in the belly. And pounding these shots like that this quick, usually I handle my alcohol pretty damn well. I'm a big dude, big frame. I can handle it. I'm good. I usually do doubles, actually. Uh, but when I have nothing in my stomach, the shit fucks you up quick. So there's a very good chance I could be a little loopier than I meant to be. But by the way, guys, while Wheezy's getting his drink, this is home of fight. This is the new home for the Die Hard MMA podcast. And I see you all have found it. We've already got 80 live viewers on the show. So everybody do us a favor. Hit the like button. And uh, we're drinking. We're drinking. So you better hit the damn like button again because we're, we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to be... Uh, a little loosey goosey here for this one. And, uh, you know, this last shot, I know it's owed. I know it's a shot that I have to do. I'm contractually obligated to do this shot, but this last shot I am going to dedicate to one Kirk cousins, because I know this is an MMA stream, but my boy Kirk just got signed by the Atlanta Falcons. My Vikings have lost yet another quarterback. And I just want to thank Kirk O'Chains for everything he brought to the Minnesota Vikings. And here's to another shitty year of me cheering for a team that has a hard time putting it all together because I'm a Coyotes fan and I'm a Vikings fan, Wheezy. And I don't know that there's more pain possible with a back-to-back -back franchise like that. So here we go. <laughs> You're talking to a Cub fan and a Bear fan. So I'm fine with Kirk Cousins leaving to go to the South because <laughs> we don't need him whooping our bare asses every week. So yeah, so that'll be know. a good one. All right, Go cheers to man. that. Absolutely, <laughs> my man. Oh, and I didn't bring a chaser. Go. I got some water here, thankfully, but I'm yeah, not gonna lie, usually tea. it's a Coke with the acid that helped me helps me get multiple shots down like that. Now we're, we're primed up get out and of ready here. to go here. 
Banned for life. Banned for life. <laughs> Come on, Mushroom. These people from Philly, they have no class, I'll tell you. Hey, That's why hey, they root least, for the Eagles. At least the Eagles are all retiring, right? They're going to have half a team by football season, so I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> nah, they're so much better than the Bears that I can't even talk anything about them, you know? So, <laughs> All right, everybody. We've gone for 25 minutes, and the show is just getting started. If that's not entertainment, I don't know what is. Hit the like button for me, and let's get after it. First fight of the night, you've got Chad and Hellinger, and he is taking on Charles Ampos Gregorio. And I believe I'm close on that, Wheezy. Unless I'm mistaken, you know how to pronounce this man's name. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's Haralambos. Uh, that's a Ramos. that's the Greek name is Harry. It's just Harry, you know. But the Greeks have got a flair for adding about 14 extra letters to everything that they have to do. So yeah, Haralambos. That sounds so much cooler. Like, it does, doesn't would, it? Yeah. I would introduce myself as Harambos if my name was Gary, too, or Harry. <laughs> Either way, Gary, Harry, fireball's already kicking in, folks. We're off the rails right to get started. My, my wife's going to come home and absolutely kill me. You know what I'll do? You know what I'll do? Here, let me let me just check here real quick, guys. So I'm in, I'm in StreamYard. That's our streaming program. And I got to pull up the YouTube here. All right, we got 80 people live on the show right now, and I only see 26 likes. Come on. First off, shame on you. Second, game. Wheezy and I do another shot at 100 likes. You guys get us to 100 likes, we'll do another shot, and we'll see what happens from there. Maybe we bargain a little bit. Let's drunk stream loading. Let's see what you got. All right, Wheezy. There's still a decent yeah. amount left in here, you know? I got I got a good amount of tequila. We, we got a little bit. So. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying here. Anyway, we got some yeah, fireball man. to work with. So we go. Could have some fun tonight. Game prepared. All right. <clears throat> Chad and Hellinger is 37 years old. He is currently on a two-fight losing streak. But this dude's tough, Wheezy. And the thing about Chad is not his physicality. It's the immeasurables. He is all heart. He's like Darren Elkins. He's one of these guys that just never fucks off. Like, he tries to force a bit of a brawl. He stays in your face. He wants to bite down on the mouthpiece and swing heavies. He does roll and counter well. That's the one thing that I'll say that I really like about Chad and Hellinger's striking game is he'll get in the pocket and he knows how to avoid those big shots and come back with big ones of his own. He does tend to get bullied physically a little bit. The grappling has kind of always been his weakness. Um, he got bullied by Johnson in his last fight, but he was actually able to kind of turn the script a little bit. He got Johnson with a trip takedown. He hit a big double leg. He ended up getting reversed in a couple of those, but he did get top position for a couple of times and he just never quits. The problem is the submission defense. If you can get to this guy's back, if you can get a dominant position, you know, this guy will end up tapping, unfortunately, but he's impossible to knock out. So I think there's, there's a bit of respect that we have to have for Chad and Hellinger unless he's going up against a dangerous grappler. Now, Gregorio, 8-3, and three, it's his UFC debut off of Dana White's Contender Series. You guys know I've got my Dana White's Contender Series fade angle where these guys come into the UFC just way too hyped. They come in off of big knockout wins. They're flashy. They're young. They look good. Dana's raving about them, and they're just not quite ready for the UFC level, how many of these guys have we seen go like one and four and then get cut? Like they're just, they're not necessarily the talent they look like when you get them in a, a cockfighting championship, which is Dana White's contender series and go, Hey, winner gets a contract. If they get it done in under a minute, like that, yeah. that's what that show is. So we've got Chad and Hellinger at plus plus one forty. You've got Gregorio. Who's the favorite at minus minus one sixty, uh, minus one sixty five. Gregorio is coming from Mongol Weidman MMA, which, to be fair, is a really damn good gym. And a lot of guys look really good coming out of there. He's got very fast hands. He's got decent power. He stays heavy on his feet. He likes to kind of plod his way forward into the pocket with people. And then he does the blitz attack thing where he'll close a lot of distance really quickly with some big, wild, power, powerful strikes. He's got a flying knee on him that he has pretty good accuracy with. Good, solid blast double. Everything he does is just like muscle explosion, muscle explosion. And he can be a bit of a wet blanket on top. He's very heavy from his top position. He will have a three-inch reach advantage over Chad and Hellinger here in this spot. The one thing I want to mention, though, the way this guy loses he kind of slows down, and I think he kind of gets figured out against better opposition. He's lost by decision twice, and he was KO'd in round three by none other than my guy, C. Rod, Christian Rodriguez, who is later on this card, in fact, was someone who was able to wear him out over two rounds and then finish him in the third. And C. Rod and Chad have a very similar 
Um, yeah, basic profile. Obviously, C Rod is far better than Chad and Hellinger. But if you're gonna give me a guy that can scramble, that can brawl, that can fight, and then in the third round, when you're getting off the stool, going, bro, what does it take to get this guy out of here? They will punch you in the fucking mouth. Chad's that guy. So even though he's 12 and 7 and 37 years old, this is the archetype of fighter that I want going against Gregorio. I hate to say it, but I think first fight of the night, dog or pass. I'm not laying minus 165 on Gregorio, who's unproven at this point, and I have seen him get beaten by exactly this kind of guy. I think Gregorio could wet blanket Chad and kind of keep him down and just be bigger and more physical than him. He's far younger, so that's definitely a possibility. But I could see Chad and Hellinger hurting this guy late as he slows down. I think it's a beautiful live betting situation for Chad and Hellinger. Um, man, one of those gross spots where like I think I kind of have to pick Gregorio to actually win the fight, but a round three sprinkle on Chad? You guarantee that's going to be something I'll take a look at. I hope we get a good number. Wheezy, what do you make of this fight? Any numbers we should know? Because if you guys don't know, Wheezy is MMA's stat daddy. He's got all the numbers, and he's going to tell us where those numbers find value for us betting on mixed martial arts. So, Wheezy, what are we looking at here? Yeah, you know, the first number that kind of stuck out was the over one and a half for this fight because there's two things that I know, right? Chan and Helliger, when he finishes fights, it tends to be in the second half of the fight. Like you said, he's a guy that's going to scrap early. He's going to land some big shots. He's going to wear on you. He's going to push a high pace and then maybe break you in the second half of the fight. Now, Haralambos, in the on the other hand, is a guy who's very front-loaded. I mean, he's got a lot of power in his right hand, and he's going to come and he's going to kind of try to put pressure forward, get into that range, and land that big right hand. And if it lands, you're probably going down and you're probably going to get knocked out. Six of his eight wins inside the distance by way of knockout. So Haralambos has got some early power. That, that really has to be respected. But I feel like we can trust Ann Hellinger's durability because the guy really is durable. He's been finished in six of seven losses, but he's never been knocked out. It's always by submission. And while I've seen Gregorio on tape kind of string together some submission um, attempts and look pretty smooth doing it, he's training over at Longo and Weidman. So you know he's getting good BJJ work in over there. That's a great camp to train for BJJ and everything else for MMA in particular. Those guys are some of the best coaches in the game. So he's getting good coaching, but he's coming from a smaller regional scene. He he is originally from Cyprus, you know, so he kind of came over here. He's the less experienced fighter. Um, he's the guy uh, that hasn't fought the the type of competition that Ann Hellinger has, especially Ann Hellinger having three fights at the UFC level, a Dana White's contender series fight against a tough dude in Muin Gafarov. You know, uh, it, it's a lot better than than Gregorio's wins over guys like Smotherman and Disanel and Christosimo and and those type of guys. But six he's fighting and five, two and five, three and zero, oh, eight and six. Not the worst guys. I mean, it's the regional scene. You're not going to be fighting all killers on the regional scene. He, and he's in CFFC, he's fighting decent level of comp. He fought Christian he's Rodriguez. A- you know, so the guys fought. You know, who I mean, really good yeah, up and coming fighters. He's not afraid to take a tough fight on the regional scene. But, you know, he's already almost 32 years old. And to me, when I watch this guy fight, I'm not seeing a big minute winner. I'm seeing a guy who's got a lot of power early, and you really have to respect that power early. And he does have a very opportunistic submission game. We haven't seen him finish any fights via submission. But when you watch his fights, you'll see him chasing some leg locks, some triangles, some arm bars. He'll be scrambling. Um, He's a good fighter, but he's a little bit front-loaded. And Chad's just fought the better guys. He's a little more experienced. And when I saw this, uh, Haralambos was minus 200, and, and, and Helger was plus 170. I was like, man, that's Ooh. not right. That's not right. That's too much. for. Uh, but now it's, you, people have agreed with that sentiment. Now the money's starting to come in on, on, on Helger, but he's still 37 years old and on a two-fight losing streak. So for me, that over one and a half is a little bit underpriced according to um, my prop template here. Let me get the exact numbers for you. Um, Minus 215 for the over one and a half is about a 68% implied probability. About 69% of Bantamweight fights scheduled for three rounds go over that number. And all three of Chad Ann Helliger's UFC fights have went over 1.5 rounds. So uh, he, he is a guy that at the UFC level against a higher level of competition is, is going to second half of fights. So um, minus 215 is what we call a trifecta bet on my template because all three metric comparisons 
indicate mm-hmm. that the the line is underpriced according to those metrics that we compare. So um, that's the way I'm looking at this fight right now. My pick, I don't even know what my pick is, dude. I, <laughs> I, I actually wrote up the whole fight, and the only part that I left I left blank was pick because I really do feel that this is a very close fight. Yeah, I wish I had kind of moved in on this earlier, man. I would love to have plus 170 on Chad and Hellinger. That sounds a whole lot more enticing yeah. than the plus 140. And I know it's just 30 cents. You guys are a lot of pick the winner type of people. So, like, I, I get it. I think it's dog or pass. Uh, looking at Bet Online, that's where a lot of the early props come out at for us. You know, stateside, we got to wait until DraftKings and FanDuel get their shit together and get up here. Um, but Gregorio by sub is eight to one, which I mentioned that seems to be kind of the Achilles heel here for Chad and Hellinger, that doesn't seem like a bad sprinkle if you want to go that route because this guy can kind of blast double leg him. And like Weezy mentioned, he's got a decent sub game coming against a, uh, or training out of a fight camp that works a lot with grappling, lots of submissions, lots of different opportunities from Longo Weidman MMA. And then I feel like we're being sold short just a little bit here, Weezy. Chad and Hellinger in round three is just 11 to one. That feels a little gross to me. Like for a guy that's a plus 140 dog yeah. who's 37 years old, who's not supposed to win this fight, we should be getting a better number than 11 to 1. So almost like the bookies might know a little something, something about that spot. We'll see what numbers we get, obviously, uh, when they come stateside. Real quick, I want to give a shout out here. And I made an idiot and I scrolled Ted B saying, I never watch. Already liked, waiting to hear something. Ted B, you're in the right place. You're going to hear plenty tonight, baby. And he's trying to get me drunk. I will let you guys know that tipsy wobble already hit me. Three shots in a row, bang, 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 on an empty stomach like that. Ah, Your boy's already feeling it just a little bit. So we got the party started. Ted, welcome to the show. You're going to want to hang out here. We have a good time. Best chat in the game. And I know a lot of people say that. We might not be the, now, and no offense, man. We might not be the sharpest bunch, but we're the nicest damn chat on the internet. So if you want to come hang out and talk MMA and have a good time doing it, this is the home for you right here on the Die Hard MMA podcast. Jake in the house. My guy, Jake, is a wonderful interviewer. You guys need to check him out on Twitter. He said, last fight on a Hellinger's contract also. Told me he's prepared to die in there for a new contract and win. That is some awesome news. You guys know sometimes I read a little too much into the fighters and their mental state, you know, and how they're feeling, what they're talking about. That's the kind of news that has me feeling a Hellinger a little, a little bit. You know, obviously, there's physical limitations. Obviously, if you're not going to beat somebody because you're older or less skilled, et cetera, whatever, that's going to happen anyway. However, if the effort level is there and you're ready to go out on your shield, it gives you just kind of that extra little push. He's not talking about retirement. He's not talking about hanging it up. He's not talking about moving on or investing in his company. This guy's ready to go out there and die in the cage. Love to hear it. Love to hear that. Let's freaking go. All right. FUBU is saying Jamie Pickett, Tyson Pedro, Mateos Mendonca, Mark Madsen, Daniel Lacerda, Denise Bondar, Luis Saldana, Fernie Garcia, Mike Breedine, all cut as of today. I feel bad for Mike Breedine. He had that big old comeback in round three, got a big win in his last fight and ended up getting cut. Pedro retired. So, I mean, I get that. But yeah, bloodbath today. So did Absolute Mark. bloodbath today. And so did Mark Madsen. I'm pretty sure Mark Madsen retired as well. Oh, he he absolutely retired and yeah, he died okay, in the cage good. in his last fight. But I, I don't care who you are. If you're getting TKO'd by Gordon, you you probably should retire. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah. I I had Mark Madsen's finish only prop, and I famously said on my show that J, you know Jared Gordon couldn't finish a glass of water, and then he finishes <laughs> in the first round. It's dude, a fun sport that we bet on, man. First, you know, and that's a great round. thing. You know, as as hard as we work, as much work as we do online and behind the scenes, it's it's spectacular how wrong we can get it at times isn't it man i mean like it is that's the fun part about this is it's you know you 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 learn after a long time doing this to never overstate your confidence about something because you know it can go tits up in a heartbeat and it does so often man wheezy that is half the fun because if you plant your flag if you go confident on something you got a 50-50 shot of looking like a fucking idiot yeah. the next morning. Because like in this fight, people break toes in the cages. People get yeah. hit with flying knees after being yeah. up two rounds to zero. Like it's it's bottled chaos in that cage. And that's why we love this sport. But we're essentially yeah. masochists for trying 
to bet on it. Uh, pass it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. My friend Nichols says dog or pass. We got Kevin with a two unit play already on Chad and Hellinger. Gotta mm-hmm. love to hear it. Caddy daddy trying to get me drunk says smash the like button. We got 50. <laughs> We got 104 live viewers with 50 likes. If you guys want me to do another shot, there's 50 of you just sitting there twiddling your damn thumbs. What are you doing? Get in there. Hit the like button. We'll do another shot. It's that simple. I'm already getting wobbly. Let's freaking go. Next flight up, you've got Corey McKenna making her UFC return. Long-awaited UFC. long away. That was supposed to be long-awaited Wheezy. I ended up saying long-awaited UFC. Long-awaited UFC return, Wheezy, for Corey McKenna fighting Jacqueline Amorim, and I love this fight. I love it so much. Corey McKenna, eight and two, just 24 years old. She's a spring chicken. She has this grinding, bullying, grappling, wrestling style. She was Sarah McMahon's protege, which, by the way, is a fantastic place to come from. She is currently training out of Team Alpha Male, and she's getting a lot of work with Invicta champion Tina Black and Macy Barber, who just got her hand raised this past weekend. It's a good place, I think, for her to be working out of. Striking, obviously something that she needs to kind of patch up. She's been primarily a wrestler, and she's got a lot of room to grow, but the boxing is getting better. She doesn't really have any pop in her hands, and I think that's something that's maybe a little bit concerning, because she's not going to get the respect she needs on the feet from people, but The technique is getting there. Really good wrestling. Good feints that open up her hands really well. Short, compact, really strong body lock. She'll kind of drag you around the cage with that thing. She hasn't competed since December of 2022, Weezy. And that's something that normally the layoff, people would kind of raise a red flag. But at this age, that's probably a good thing. If she's taken a year to just kind of develop her craft, that's what you want from a fighter that's 24 years old. She's going to have developed, I'm expecting, big improvements from her If she's somebody who's got the kind of trajectory that I think she's going to have, she should be better after taking a year off to work. You know, in her last fight, she absolutely dominated Cheyenne Velismus, which was a big surprise for a lot of people. Thankfully, I called that upset. And to my surprise, it was mostly standing. I thought she was going to need to go to the grappling for that fight, but she did it on the feet, which impressed the hell out of me. Now, she has mostly had a low level of competition, but her two losses, Wheezy, were both by split decision. So, like... We could be looking at a 10-0 and undefeated women's MMA prospect right now this close to her getting that type of respect. She's got 71% takedown defense. Kay Hansen went 2 of 5. Vanessa Demopoulos, 1 of 2. That's where those takedowns came from that kind of messed her up. So if you don't have a solid grappling game, which actually I think Kay Hansen was just a little bit underrated in her time, that's a really great t- takedown defense rating to have at this stage of her career. Jacqueline Amorim, 7-1, and one, 28 years old, training out of ATT. And guess who gave her that one, Wheezy? My girl, Sam Page, Sam freaking Hughes. That's who. She's a BJJ world champion, one and one so far in the UFC. And it's funny because Sam did what Sam does. She came out and survived round one and then beat the brakes off this girl after she got out of that first round. But Amarim immediately pivoted, made some adjustments, and didn't blow her wad in her next fight. Now, the UFC softballed her about as easy of a little underhand toss as you could get. If there's anybody that's going to knock this fight out of the park, I mean, Montserrat Ruiz, what a perfect opponent, Wheezy. I went, like, really heavy on Amarim inside the distance in that spot because it was like, Montserrat Ruiz headlocks chicks and drags them to the ground. That's all she has. Mm -hmm. This girl's a BJJ world champion. It's not like she's going to get beat up on the feet by Ruiz. Ruiz can't do shit. So it was like the perfect spot for Amorim to have a bounce back. And she ended up just kind of doing her thing. TK her in the third round. It was a good performance, but it was also kind of eye-opening that it was like, damn, man, Montserrat Ruiz took her to the third. Like, she defended a couple of bad positions. She got back to her feet. She had some decent strikes going on there. Amorim struggled in a couple places. If it wasn't her, if it wasn't for her getting some like body triangle back control time she, against a better opponent, man, she would have been in trouble. I think Amorim's got a suspect ga- gas tank. And like a lot of jujitsu players, as opposed to wrestlers who switch over to MMA, if she's not able to get a dominant grappling position like with that body triangle, she can be in a really bad position. She can slow down. She can get tired. She can get controlled. She's out of her depth on the feet. Yes, she can ground and pound. That's great. She can go full chase hooper and, and get a reversal and get on top of you and elbow the shit out of you. That's all fine and dandy. But she's got nothing on the feet. 
she's got a zero percent takedown defense because she's ready to go to her back and look for sweeps. Yeah. I mean, this is a spot where early in the week I was like, man, Corey McKenna, Corey McKenna's got to be the side. Um, this fight opened up with Corey being a slight underdog. It went to Pickums. Now Corey McKenna is minus 125. So it looks like the money is starting to come in here on Corey McKenna. And that was the side that at first glance I liked immediately. The only thing that kind of gives me a little bit of pause, Wheezy, is that Corey McKenna is primarily a grappler and she doesn't have power on the feet. If you're going to get bulldozed by one bad takedown and you're facing a jiu-jitsu world champion who can snap your ankle in half, Amarim is exactly like what we were talking about. My opinion of, you know, Jailton Almeida. She can catch this young kid in the first round. McKenna could make a mistake grappling in the first round. And that worries me. But I think the deeper the fight goes, the more it favors McKenna. And I think I kind of am going to go ahead and pick Corey McKenna to win. She's young. She's strong. She's tough. She's fighting out of a good gym. And I think she'll put a pace on Jacqueline Amorim and eventually beat her up. So, I, you know, I'll go ahead and go back to my classic, man. Round three. Let's say Corey McKenna gets a round three TKO when Amarim's exhausted and has nothing left to give. Yeah, I got no problem with that. You know, Jacqueline Amarim in two UFC fights, she's only spent 21% of her cage time at distance striking range. And for McKenna, it's 47%. So both these ladies spend more than half their time grappling. And I think that's where they're both most comfortable. Um, so often in these situations, Wrestler versus jiu-jitsu player. Who wins the minutes, Clint? Wrestlers, Wheezy. Wrestlers. that They win the minutes, right? They are the ones who get to decide whether the fight goes to the ground or whether it doesn't. Jiu-jitsu players generally have dog shit takedown offense. They, they, they never really learn. You know, when we would do judo and the jiu-jitsu guys would come to train with us, we'd shave their ass on the feet. We'd be throwing them all around like a sack of potatoes. But as soon as it hit the ground, we were in we were in trouble, you know, but that's not me. You know, I'm old. I'm slow. You know, like <laughs> Corey McKenna can handle herself on the ground. And it's not like we haven't seen her in these kind of matchups before. Right. Clint, Vanessa Demopoulos, Brazilian mm -hmm. Jiu Jitsu black belt really is just somebody who likes to go for submissions on the ground. And that fight who might be is... a lot physically stronger than Amarine, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Vanessa's a unit. She's strong. She's built. She's got power on the feet and she's really strong. Um, I mean, you look at her abs and you're like, yeah, man, you know, it's the thighs a, for me, Wheezy. Not yeah. to just like, I mean, her the, her thighs are bigger than mine. Like she, you know, um, did you ever play Mortal Kombat, Wheezy? Yeah, I did. I you did. You know the back chick the that day. like chokes people out with like cro crossing her ankles like behind <laughs> the guy's head that I really feel like Vanessa Demopoulos could do that. Vanessa, if you're watching, I need to see a video of that. I need you to like <laughs> cartwheel kick somebody and then wrap your thighs around somebody's head from bottom and see how long they last before they tap. Cause I think she could pull that shit off. The old TP choke. That's what that is, man. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, she probably has gotten a couple of those in the gym with, with her, with her thighs, the way they are. She's strong, you know? So, and Corey was, was all right on the ground against Vanessa was constantly winning the minutes there and staying in the dominant positions and landing some ground and pound. Kay Hansen too. Kay Hansen's not a black belt, but she's a, you know, she's a very aggressive submission grappler and, and Corey was fine on the, on the ground against her as well. Now, obviously I'm a reams of BJJ world champions, you know, so she's better on the ground than both of those girls, but still at the end of the day, it's a similar type of fight that she's going to see there. And she's, that this is one spot where it's actually great to have a 58 inch reach against somebody that can arm bar you, you know? So, <laughs> oh, Dizzle, oh, Dizzle volunteering his tribute it. for the TP joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I think that Corey's probably more likely to win the minutes here. And like you said, especially as the fight goes on, we've been, we've been shown that Corey um, has good conditioning and she can go with full three rounds with that wrestling heavy game plan. Um, and, and win minutes with her grappling, win minutes with her wrestling. And she is going to be the better wrestler. And it's not like Amarim is stopping anybody's takedowns. And even on the feet, right? Because Jacqueline does have a nine and a half inch reach advantage. You know, she's still only 28 years old. She's training at at and I mean, like her standup is going to be getting better and it doesn't look horrible. You know, it doesn't look like, you know, like a, like a sixth grade girls fight. Like she's not like doing that shit she's she's 
pretty clean, you know, but obviously she's not knocking people out and stuff like that yet. We got to, we got to worry about her being able to win some minutes with her striking because people will be worried about Jacqueline's grappling more than the striking. She's got to make strides there because she'll be able to surprise some people with her striking. And then once she surprises them with that, that's what's going to set up the easy takedowns for her and allow her to be able to get to the dominant positions where she can finish fights. So uh, we got to still learn a little bit more about Jacqueline. I mean, I think that this is a very close fight. Very um, good fight. I Completely think that Jacqueline agree. is going to be very dangerous early while they're both dry, while they're both at 100% and not tired yet. That fight's going to go to the ground, and Jacqueline is going to be going for submissions, and Corey is going to have to really mind her P's and Q's. But I think as the fight goes on, Corey's experience is going to make a big difference. Her, the, the ability to wrestle and dictate whether the fight goes to the ground or not is going to be make a big difference in the conditioning advantage, I think, that we've seen there makes her the more likely favorite here. So I think Amareem early, Corey late, but I do like the over 2.5 grounds here, Brady, or I mean, Clint, and I bet it. Um, the, um, the implied probabilities here uh, for the over 2.5 rounds at minus 185, that's a 65% price or implied wow. probability on that line. But 71% of women's straw weight fights go over 2.5 rounds. Amareem's been over two and a half rounds twice at the UFC level. And for McKenna, it's three of four. So 83.33% of their combined six UFC fights have went over two and a half rounds. And we're only paying 65% on the line. So I took a one unit shot on the over two and a half rounds here. I have faith that Corey McKenna won't get submitted early. And I also have faith that she's really not knocking anybody out on the feet. And I don't think she's submitting a BJJ black belt either. So I am going to figure that this one goes to decision. And I'm going to pick Corey McKenna to win by decision. You know, Weezy, the one thing I think I can say, though, is that uh, you've got Amareem who doesn't want to strike and who tires out. And with someone like Corey McKenna who likes to wrestle, her striking isn't anything to write home about. But her ground and pound is solid. That's where I think the finish is. Because if, if she can avoid getting subbed, you've got Amaroom who wants to be on her back, who will get tired. And then when this mauling wrestling chick gets her in a crucifix position, like I think the ref might pull her off. So that's that's the one app. Whoa, pardon me. Excuse me, guys. Sorry about that. Microphone not doing its job right now. Getting that burp <laughs> on. Uh, that's the shots speaking, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I think that's how we get to the TKO if it happens. But that's where I'm with you. Probably really late round three, probably a decision close and competitive fight um mma hedge fund saying that amarim is taking round one and i mean probably more often than not nickels like amarim finish only i think that makes a ton of sense here god you guys i love the chat i love having the chat back i've missed you guys so much rusty says correct me if i'm wrong um amarim is mainly a choke specialist you know in mma it looks like she's got like a lot of arm bars and stuff like that she does so have arm bars um, yeah, which is the women's MMA, you know, staple basically. And then pass at 31 says Elise Reed, never forget. And I get what you're saying. However, Elise Reed's a really good kickboxer. If she can keep the fight standing, yeah. she actually has power and she can strike really well. So that's not as bad of a loss as you would think. Honestly, I, I you know, I would like to have seen, um, McKenna get takedowns in that fight because at least Reed can't grapple to save her life, but she was outgunned on the feet at that stage of her career. And at that very ripe young age in her life, she's gotten better since then. And especially with the year on year long layoff, I wouldn't hold that one too much against her. Um, Joe, my guy looking out for me saying Clint. Oh, we're getting lag here on Streamyard. No more shots. Stay buzzed. Not drunk. Don't worry, Joe. I can hold my liquor. I'm good. I call it a drunk stream because it's more fun to say it that way, but I'm all right. We are currently at 63 likes, so if you guys want me to take another shot, get me to 100, and then we're talking. All right, everybody. Let's go ahead and move along to the next fight. Next up, we've got an absolute banger, Wheezy. Joshua Kalibau takes on Danny Silva, and I've got a soft spot, man. I've got such a soft spot for Josh Kulibau. He's a guy who made his UFC debut taking on Jalen Turner. And, and I think the world of Jalen Turner, but he's a weight bully and he hits really freaking hard and he's got good submission offense. And that's the only guy that's actually been able to uh, finish Joshua Kalibau so far here in the UFC. And on top of that, he was in deep, man. He was in some big, nasty choke positions. 
And this guy wouldn't tap. He defended all of them. He he just refused to die in those situations. And he was on short notice, and he was up a weight class, and eventually the ref pulled Jalen Turner off of him. But he wasn't even all the way knocked out. Joshua Kalibo's calling card is he is durable as hell. He was on a three-fight win streak and got snapped off by Lerone Murphy, who went to uh, work with a grappling game in, in that fight, Wheezy, and just did some some real good work in that fight. But Josh is still 11-2-1, just 29 years old, and he's really light on his feet. Really great movement, decent power in his hands, a little low volume, a little unorthodox, but those strikes come from angles where a lot of people just aren't expecting. I already touched on the submission defense. He is super hard to get out of there. So if you're going to be in there with this guy, he is dangerous, he hurts people, and as long as you leave an opening, he can finish. Danny Silva, 8-1, and one, another debutante coming off of Dana White's Contender Series. He's actually managed by Cub Swanson, and they really believe this guy is, like, the next big thing. I mean, again, I, I don't buy into these Dana White's Contender Series prospects the way of a lot of people do. Um, but if Cub Swanson has given you the okay, then maybe there's a little something to it here in this spot. But, uh, man really filthy clinch attacks his knees his elbows he's got a really strong like hook over the back of his opponent's neck big knees in that position heavy calf kicks i like his combinations he's got fast hands he's got a quick one too extremely accurate and he likes to get in tight and like roll you know those you see those movies where people are like training boxing they always send them to like mexico or some shit when they get like a little too soft they've been training at these you know fancy fancy places they like ship them off to some third world country and they're like learn how to box with the real they like put like a a tire down on the ground and make both people put their foot. And I know this is a real drill, by the way, it's not just movie, but you always see it in cinema where, you know, they put them in there against the toughest son of a bitch that's out in the desert heat and stick them in the sun. And they always lose that guy beats the shit out of them. And they just get in close like this and they start like, you know, rolling and they're just like ripping the body. And that's what Silva does wheezy. And mm -hmm. I love it. He's going to hurt some people to the body. I just can see it coming. He started fast on Dana White's contender series hurt his opponent in round one because that's what you're supposed to do on there and then he kind of fell apart he started to slow down he started to get figured out and that's my concern here is that if he comes out with that same type of attitude against a guy like joshua kalibo i don't know if he can go a full 15 minutes with him now he won a decision he got his hand raised but i've got questions about danny silva coming in here into this spot the saving grace, I think, might be the fact that Josh Kuliba is a little bit low volume. If he does get tired, if he does slow down, he's not necessarily facing somebody who's going to step on the gas and melt him. He can probably catch a wind. And then this fight is extremely competitive going forward. Joshua Kuliba is a minus 160 favorite. You can get plus 135 on Danny Silva. <sighs> I think I have to pick Josh Kuliba to get the win. But I'm not laying that price tag, Wheezy. And I know it doesn't seem like it's that expensive. 160 is probably very playable in this type of a fight. But as I mentioned, I kind of feel like it's tough dude versus better or higher ceiling. Not better necessarily. But I think Danny Silva's got a higher ceiling than Josh Kaliba does. So if these, are, these guys are going to go to war for a full 15 minutes, I think it's going to be very, very close. And Silva may just have more volume. So it's probably a little bit dog or pass for me. I think it's going to be a tight decision here. Yeah, this one is a wild one. It's going to be a really fun fight because, like you said, Silva's one of those cats that, like, stands on your shadow, and he's just in that pocket. His guard's high. He's going to be moving his head. He's going to be slipping and ripping, and he loves to be in there. And Kulaba is a guy with a 73-inch reach for this division, so he's a kind of a guy that likes to stay on the outside, use that length, keep you on the end of his punches, keeps use some kicks to kind of maintain distance, move laterally. So. Um, I think that this is going to be about which one of these guys gets their way because I've seen Josh Kulabau deal with pressure pretty well in the past. I, he moves well. He will stand his ground when his when his opponent is being reckless. And if you're not careful, you can walk on to something. kulabau has got power, man. He's got three knockdowns and only six UFC fights. He's landing a knockdown on over 1.7% of the distant strikes that he lands. That's well above average for the division. And this guy's 5-1 and one to the KO in his career. Silva... 5-0 and o to the KO in his career. So here's what I think is going to happen. I don't really know who's going to win this fight, but I think that these dudes are going to hit each other hard. Josh Kulabau couldn't take down a sack of potatoes. Danny Silva won't be shooting takedowns. He's just It's just not his game. 
He's a boxer. J- Kulaba was 0 for 13 on takedowns in the yeah. UFC. It's not like he's not trying. You know, God bless him. He's trying. He's just not a wrestler. You know, he's not going to get you down. And, and Silva's seen that kind of a game plan in the past. As a matter of fact, his only loss as a pro comes a two-time Dana White contender series guy, uh, Kanan Kawaihai, who we've seen go in there and gas out two different times, actually. One of them was like a crazy gas out. He completely was done after one round. But what Kawaihai did was go out there and wrestle Danny Silva for two rounds successfully and win a bunch of minutes over the first two rounds. Then he was exhausted in the third, but Silva couldn't get him out of there. He was close, but he couldn't quite get him out of there. So, um, uh, I think he lost a majority decision. Yeah, it was a majority decision because I think one of the guys gave Silva a 10-8 in the third round. So obviously a very close fight. But that's not cool about his game. He doesn't get takedowns. And I think if he tries, he's going to be walking on to some stuff and, and eating some elbows and uh, really kind of walking into the anti-grappling of Danny Silva, which is solid. So the way that I played this was because I was kind of agnostic about who won the fight but I had an idea of how I thought it was going to play out. Why not the under? Why not the under two and a half rounds, man? Josh Kulabau's got a ton of power, and this guy Silva is going to get in that pocket, and he's going to be looking for opportunities to walk forward and pressure his opponent, which A, is going to open up Kulabau's opportunities to land the big shot, and B, it's going to get Kulabau on his back foot. It's going to allow Silva to get into that pocket, put together some combinations, land some big shots to the body and the head, potentially get a knockout of his own plus 155 is where I got it it's still going the other way for some reason now it's plus 165 and my question would be did these people watch the Angel Pacheco fight you know because that dude could get hit in the head with a hammer and keep going on Danny Danny Silva should have finished that dude seven different times and I'm pretty sure if it was anybody but Angel Pacheco about 75% of those guys go down at the second or third time that Danny had him in trouble. Dude, he landed over 200 significant strikes over a 15-minute period. There's not a lot of people that can stand up to that kind of a beating. And the fact that he's landing that many significant strikes means he is pressuring, means he is walking forward, means he is very comfortable in that pocket. So I'm looking for violence here, man. I got that under 2.5, one unit on it at plus 155. Wow. Wow. I don't mind it, Wheezy. I don't mind it. Now, the one thing I would say is that I could definitely like lean on the durability of Kalibau. He's so tough to actually get out of there. Um, Danny Silva by KO is four to one. Danny Silva by points is only plus 325. That's not that bad of a discount uh, from that KO number there. And this thing is favored to go over two and a half. So you've got a short dog who you're getting over three to one on to win by a decision. That's got my interest. Uh, we might have found a nice little dog or pass spot here for me, Wheezy. I may be interested in Danny Silva coming in. That's a lot of strikes to throw in, especially, like I mentioned, with the low volume of Kalibo. Unless he really hurts this guy, he's probably going to lose on those numbers. So I like it. We, we might be looking at Danny Silva by the end of the night here, folks. Shout out real quick to our guy, Oldie, saying, what's the over-under on Uncle Wheezy's harem ratio or ham ratio? Is that ham? Oh, ham man. radio. Ham radio. Ham radio. He, he knows I I'm heard old. That. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, I don't have a ham radio, though. I'm not that old. Like, you know, people that, that, were, that had that kind of a hobby back when I was in grade school, they got the shit kicked out of them. So, yeah, I wasn't going to be doing that either. Wheezy, I got to tell you, I completely misread that. I read this on over-under for Wheezy's harem ratio. And I was going to set the number at six and a half. I was going to set the number at six and a half. So you guys tell me over or under Wheezy's harem ratio, six and a half. How many ladies does Wheezy have stacked up in that house behind him? Cause I, I think I, I'm going to lay, it's going to be over six and a half minus minus one forty. That's how I'm setting that number. So let, let me know the bets in the chat here for that one. <laughs> All right, next fight up. Tiago Moises gets a short notice fill-in replacement. Mitch Ramirez is coming in here to take on this fight. Good stuff. And Weezy, thank God for Bet Online because otherwise we wouldn't even have a number to talk about here for this one. They have a nice big chalky favorite on Tiago Moises, as is tradition. Minus 360 on Moises. The comeback on Mitch Ramirez is plus 295. And, and I like this fight. Weezy, I really do. Tiago Moises is a guy that 
I've had kind of an up and down history with. He's been good to bet on. He's been good to bet against in certain situations, but I think I finally have got him figured out. He's 28 years old, 17 and seven, three and three in his last six. So at this point, he's just kind of a middle of the road type of fighter. He's a BJJ black belt, good everywhere, strong boxing, really good hands as well. Like, and the, the big thing is his grappling though. He's got to get his grappling going. When he gets that going, he has a lot of success. He's a bully, Wheezy. I figured it out. Tiago Moises is maybe the nicest bully you'll ever meet in your life, but he's a bully. If you can physically bully this man, he breaks. He quits. You know, a guy like Benoit Saint-Denis, which, by the way, I ran to the bank with in this spot last time when they fought. You get this big monster of a man. He wilts under that kind of pressure. You've got to be able to out-physical Tiago Moises if you're going to beat him. Mitch Ramirez, 31 years old, so he's a little bit old coming in here to the UFC. Actually lost on Dana White's Contender Series, but got to run it back in the LFA. Little tank of a man, Wheezy. I mean, dear God, the veins are popping out everywhere on this man. He looks like he is on the good, good stuff. I mean, big and powerful takedowns, blast double legs. Everything is pure power, pure raw strength. He loads up on big strikes. He's a little sloppy when he does that. You can kind of see him coming a mile away, but big hooks, big overhands, good power. I kind of worry that maybe he's a little bit of a bad nail. Another one, you know, I haven't seen enough of him to really truly say good hammer, bad nail, but that's kind of the vibe I get from this guy. And it's, Really a tough call for him to be taking on Tiago Moises in his UFC debut. He's going to have a one-inch reach advantage, does Ramirez. He will be two inches taller than Tiago Moises. And that right there is kind of the key here for him, Uweezy. If this guy is bigger and stronger and more physical than Tiago Moises, we could find ourselves in a situation where we might have a live dog. I don't know that I necessarily want to bet him at this number. I don't know him well enough to you know, throw that flyer out there. But I think I like what I've seen from Mitch Ramirez so far. And I also think with that you know, well-documented quit in Tiago Moises, three and three, He's kind of been shown the door a little bit. I know he's young, but at 28 years old, you're kind of figuring out that you're not quite there yet. You're not the guy you thought you were. Like, he's had a bit of a tough skit against anybody who's actually in the contender's circle. I kind of think he's in maybe a little bit of a vulnerable spot here. On top of that, he hasn't even taken that long off, Wheezy. I mean, he got pounded out by Benoit saint and it's like six months later, he's turning around, coming right back in here. It all comes down to uh, Mitch Ramirez and the short notice. The fact that he's uh, coming in on short notice, I think, has a bit of a tough situation for this one because that gas tank. If Tiago Moises can do anything, it's outlast his opponent and then wrap up the neck the deeper this fight goes. It's going to be interesting, though. I want to see them size up. I want to see them face off. Mitch Ramirez is no stranger to actually fighting up a weight class. He's been up at 170 before. So, like, there's a lot of questions to me. The physicality may play here. I'm not laying that number on Tiago Moises, man. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I, this is one that I, I haven't really looked that much into yet, but I have watched all the tape available on, on Ramirez. And yeah, dude, this guy's a unit. And I was just actually a little bit confused because it's showing that he's bigger than Moises. And then I'm like, wait a second, he was fighting Protus. And there's no way that Protus is a lightweight, you know? And yeah, of course, he's a welterweight. So he took that fight at welterweight. There are several other fights on his record at welterweight, but his last fight was at lightweight. So, but this is a short notice fight. When you look at this dude, he's huge. Yeah. How the hell is he 5'11"? His legs are huge. His arms are huge. His his chest, he's a guy like a barrel chest. He's This he's guy massive. is... This guy's ripped up this, you know, I mean, like he, he was in prison for three and a half years and he like has the look of a guy that was in the, in that prison weight room the entire damn time that he was there. I mean, this guy's bricked up. I wouldn't want to get hit by this guy. Um, and he got picked apart by protest. Now this is, I mean, you want to talk about a completely different fight, you know, protest is a absolute sniper of a striker. That's a Southpaw. And then here you've got, you know, Tiago Moises, who's an orthodox fighter, who's not a, not the best striker, but very dangerous on the ground. You know, a BJJ mm -hmm. black belt world champion. So um, Ramirez has got to keep this fight standing. And Tiago has got some pretty good takedowns. He gets one and a half per fight. He attempts about four per fight. So he's not the most active wrestler, but he's getting them at 40%. Um, he, his grappling efficiency numbers 
they were okay. They were a little bit below average uh, for the metrics that I that I pull. But we know that if this guy gets on your back, you you lost the round and maybe the fight. So this is going to come down to whether you know Mitch can kind of keep this standing because if he does, probably the more dangerous guy on the feet just by pure power. I'm just talking in pure power sense. I mean, like Moises might be able to win the minutes on the feet as well as in the grappling exchanges, but. I would worry for Tiago's safety if you know while he was at distant striking range with this man. Um, yep. And you know, and the other thing too um, that we got to talk about: these short notice matchups are always tricky, Clint. They're always tricky because as as difficult as it is for the short notice guy to make weight and prepare for an opponent that he wasn't preparing for, Tiago Moises was preparing for Brad Riddell. You know, now he's got a completely different opponent here. Somebody that's, you know, uh, he knows way less about and somebody that's already right there in Vegas was probably ready to make the weight. He's he's training out of syndicate MMA. So he's right there. He's ready to go. He's ready to take these short notice fights and he's probably waiting for the right opportunity. So um, these kind of fights, when I got a minus 400 favorite and then I got to choose between two juiced up props, is he going to win by decision? Is he Is he finishing it? You know, and then I have to on the other side. If I like the Ramirez side, I got to wonder: Can he really beat Tiago Moises, or am I just getting good value on a plus money number at the end of the day that uh, on a ticket that's not going to cash? So these are the kind of fights that I just love staying away from. You know, but I worry about Moises getting this guy's back, and I think he could maybe do it two out of three rounds and stay safe for the rest of the time. So I like Moises here, but I'm not going to be getting to that number at minus three sixty. I hear you. I wouldn't mind a submission look on Tiago Moises. And like I mentioned, maybe those late round props after the short notice fighter gases and keep your eyes peeled for a live bet spot because this guy could come out hard in that first round looking for the kill. And then when he doesn't get it, we see a bit of a slowdown coming the other way. That's the kind of spot where I love to snipe those live bets. When you got a minus 350 favorite who's like minus 110 after the first round, but he's not dead yet type of thing. So I think this fight's got all kinds of live probabilities all over it. I will pick Tiago Moises to get the win. Wheezy, uh, but I'm interested in Ramirez as a live dog here. I want to see how that weight cut goes for him. And honestly, I might like it better if he misses by five pounds. If, if he comes in and can't quite make the weight and just says, ah, fuck it, and doesn't like kill himself trying to get down, that's the that's the Mitch Ramirez that I want here in this fight. So we will absolutely see what happens. And by the way, the bets are coming in. The under over six and a half. Wheezy uh, Mushroom is saying over. Old E is saying over. We've got Ethan with a seven unit max bet on the over six and a half for Uncle Wheezy's harem. We got royalty in the house. Kyle Marley, what is going on, my friend and my man, Razor Sharp Picks? I shouted out Nuke the House earlier. And you guys, if you haven't watched my show, if you're new to me, I am not the best handicapper in the world. I am not the best sports better in the world. But my job and my goal is to entertain you guys, hopefully tread water and maybe make a little bit of money betting, but bring you people that are actually going to put money in your pocket. I don't suggest you buy a lot of people's handicapping or betting services, but Nuke the House and Razor Sharp Picks are the two guys that I live and die by. Like They have printed me money so make sure you check out nuke the house and make sure you check out my guy razor who is right here in the chat with us all right everybody let's move right along the next fight up we have got ode osborne taking on Rafael filo jafil filo Rafael filo i'm not sure how they pronounce that one i think everything in brazil uh has that h sound attached to it but ode osborne you guys know how i feel about ode i i love ode he's a great guy he's a good dude i want to see him win I want to see him do well, but the fact of the matter is he's a weight bully with cardio and durability issues. Ode Osborne is a round one motherfucker. Like this guy will come out and he will hurt you in round one. He's also extremely intelligent. He turns some of those weaknesses that he's got into strengths. He's got good game plans every time he comes out there. I really respect what he does. But if you've got the durability and cardio to turn the tables on him after that first round, he ends up just kind of getting schooled by people who are able to take him deep. I mean, the one we see the one that always comes to mind for me is Charles Johnson not being able to get Ode out of there and losing a split decision, which, by the way, I think was a bad decision first and foremost. But the fact that Ode took a cup shot and then took veteran status right like if you're gonna pull a vet trick this is the move he took the entire five minutes he was 
fine. He took the entire five minutes to catch his breath. And that's the only reason he went a full 15 minutes with Charles Johnson. I got absolutely robbed in that spot. Thank goodness Hasu Almabayev did his job and got my money back for me there in the next fight. But that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Now, Philo is an interesting case because he is 15 and three. And you guys, that name rings a little bell for you. It's because this is the guy that absolutely destroyed Muhammad Mokayev's knee. This is the guy who went a full, well, not full, went about a 14 and a half minutes with Muhammad Mokayev, defended every single takedown in the book, and then came back and threatened to tap this guy deep in the third round. And as soon as he couldn't get that sub, Weezy, he put everything into it. He put all he had into that one final effort. And then he gave up his back and got choked out immediately. He's one and one in the UFC so far. He won his next fight against Daniel Barres, and that was a barn burner. Filo's fight with Barres, he was getting busted up, Weezy. I mean, ripping shots to the body. Barres had this guy hurt. He dropped him twice in the first round. He hurt him to the body. He hurt him to the head. And then I think it was a spot where Barres, quite frankly, I think he got a bit of a big head, Wheezy. I think he got a little too high on himself after having hurt Filo and thought it was kind of over. And Filo did what Nova Unyao guys do. And he just bit down on the mouthpiece and said, okay, let's go. And instead of being on the defensive, he went on the offensive and Barres wilted almost immediately. This guy got him down got him in a vulnerable position and choked him out in the first round. I like Philo a lot. Like he's going to be that do or die type of fighter for us. He's going to be very entertaining in the UFC as long as he lasts. But quite frankly, I've seen too many issues with him. I've seen him have trouble with the wrestling defense. I've seen him have durability problems. And I think this is the kind of fight where we could see him get hurt early. Now, if Philo survives that round one burst from Ode Osborne, then he's going to have better cardio. He absolutely will come back and finish Ode Osborne in the second or the third round. And I'm not even saying that's a possibility, Wheezy. It's a guarantee. If he gets out of the first round, Ode Osborne will not be able to keep up with the type of offense that Jafo Philo is bringing to the table in this spot. But I'm not sure he survives round one. Because Ode Osborne is that guy that will just come out there and hurt you with body shots, knees, elbows, long rangey strikes. And the way we've seen Philo hurt in the past, I think Ode could put this guy away, Wheezy. I kind of hate this fight on all accounts except for violence. I want an under in this spot. And right now, under two and a half is minus 210. So the bookies are wise to it. They know what's going on. I think this fight finishes at an extremely high clip, Wheezy. Um, I actually am kind of tempted on Ode round one. I'm curious what that number is. Bear with me. Let me see if we've got an early line for it. Ode Osborne round one is plus 575. So maybe we'll get plus 600 when the you know US books open up, but I think that's super live. And then, yeah, I would be looking towards the submission props here for Philo as the more likely outcome in this spot because we've seen Ode Osborne kind of get exposed and, and beaten on the ground time and time again. So plus 165-ish for Philo by submission. I kind of like that. Weezy, I'm going to pick Philo to go ahead and get the win here in this spot. And I am throwing out a lot of bets. I'm throwing out a lot of different angles for you here where you've got, you know, round one, Ode Osborne, round two, round three, sub for Philo. It's a tough fight to call, but fight doesn't go the distance. Parlay piece. Let's go. What are you doing here? Yeah, the, I mean, the bookies are on to it, man. They're, they know that the, this is a fight doesn't go to decision spot for sure because, uh, you know, Ode Osborne's been finishing all four of his UFC losses. Philo's been finishing his only UFC loss. And when you combine just the pro losses, right, it's seven of these guys' nine pro losses they've been finished in. And the guys that didn't finish them, you know, uh, weren't finishers. You know, like uh, Tyson Nam, Asu Almabayev subs him. You know, Nam knocks him out. But, like, these guys that are, you know, are not finishing them aren't necessarily the uh, the, the best guys. So, like, Filio is going to be the better grappler here. I have a lot more faith in his durability and, and ability to be able to finish fights, whether it's with the KO or with the submission, but definitely like his submission game a lot better than Ode's. You know, Ode's 32 years old, and he's a gigantic flyweight. He's and, huge. you know, it just seems to me like when we first saw Ode, he came in as like um, during the COVID time, right? You know, and I think he was fighting at bantamweight, and I think he might have even had a fight up at featherweight. And we kind of saw him be able to not have to cut so much weight. And then since then, you know, I mean, like he's beating CJ Vergara kind of, 
you know, he Kinda. beats, <laughs> yeah, right. And he beats Zaruk Adashev. Who cares? You know, that guy could probably make 95 pounds. You know, he loses to Tyson Nam. Uh, he gets that split decision win over Charles Johnson. And like you said, man, you know, Charles Johnson can fight for five rounds all day. I mean, the guy's got phenomenal conditioning and he used that nut shot to get a complete five minute break so that he could wind up being competitive late in the fight, which he normally wouldn't have been. And, and I mean, I'm not a huge believer in Charles Johnson either. He's definitely let me down more than a time or two at the UFC level. Uh, so I just think the feel you a guy who's finished 14 of his 15 UFC wins and a guy that we know has got legitimate opportunistic Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think that uh, he's probably going to be close on the feet with Ode, but if this thing goes to the ground, I think Jafel is just going to be way more dangerous. And I have more faith in him being able to finish fights later. So I, I, I like I like Jafel here as well. All right. I'm glad we agree on that one, Wheezy. I am going to go ahead and side with you there and pick uh, Jeff Filo here in this spot. I think that grappling weakness from Ode plus the advantage from Filo, and I know that sounds weird to say it that way, but like we know how damn good Filo is at grappling. We know his yeah. cardio is better. We know the weakness is exactly the puzzle pieces needing to get fit in here for Ode Osborne. Weak cardio, weak submission grappling. Yeah, I, I think we're going to be here on the Filo side. Um, real quick here, Dixon Cider is asking a question, Wheezy. Is your fraud alarm going off on Ode? I think Ode would be better at 135. I mean, he's a good wrestler. He's got some power, and he's huge for the flyweight division. He's so big. He's so big. And, you know, and he's 4-4 four and four here in the UFC. So, no, I mean, he's not a fraud. Definitely not a fraud. But um, he's 12-6 and six as a pro. So what we don't know about Ode is, is, like, what we don't say is, all right, well, how is Ode getting the job done here, right? I mean, he's got four wins by submission. He's got five by KO. He's got three by decision, you know, so he's a good, well-rounded fighter, but you don't really say, oh, Ode Osborne, here's the first thing I think of. First thing I think of when I think of Ode is that he's a big guy, you know? <laughs> I don't think like, oh, lockdown submission grappler, you know, minute winning with the wrestling, great distance man. I don't think any of those things. I just think like, oh, yeah, he's all right. He'll, he'll beat Zaruk Adeshev. He'll beat the brakes off of Zaruk Adeshev. And guys, you know, guys that really don't belong here. Dennis, Dennis Bondar, you know, those kind of guys. But I, I don't know about Jafel. I think Jafel is legit. Okay. I like it, Wheezy. I like it. Johnny in the house. What's up, buddy? Thank you for being here on the show. Folks, we got 115 live viewers. And if you're late to the party, if you're just tuning in, you guys got to know we're willing to do some drinking for you. If you get us to 100 likes on the stream, we will do another shot. Wheezy and already, uh, uh, Wheezy and I are already a couple deep, if you couldn't tell. I'm in for three. Wheezy's in for one on an empty stomach, mind you. So it's hitting a little harder than it probably should be. But we have 79 likes on the show right now. So get after it if you guys want us to go ahead and have some fun here. Next fight up, we've got Josiane Nunez taking on Chelsea Chandler. Wheezy, what a weird fight. This one is so strange to me. So everybody's favorite new Nunez, Josiane Nunez, I don't understand why she fights at 145 pounds. She's the shortest fighter in the division. She's got, excuse me, like she's got the knuckle draggiest arms I've ever seen in my life. Like yeah. this girl's arms are ridiculous ridiculously long i don't know how she's built the way that she is but i mean she has a reach advantage over almost everybody that she fights but she's three inches shorter than everybody that she fights it's insane and she clubs with those things man yeah. like she swings heavies and they come from crazy angles that no one can see coming because they're so long and she hurts people nunez has got serious power i wish she would take a run at 135, Wheezy, because honestly, I think she'd be a beast at 135 pounds. But she just comes forward and she swings for the fences. Uh, she attacks with big elbows off of her back. If she does get taken down, she's extremely active from down there. She's got 70% takedown defense, and that's the thing that concerns me in this fight, Wheezy. Ramona Pascal, who I made an argument for in a couple of fights, by the way, took her down three times. She's not the most athletic bunch she's not the biggest or strongest fighter. And in fact, she's been cut by the UFC at this point. She's just not that good, but she got this girl down three different times. Now in Nunez last fight, she went to war with Zara Farron 
And that was a very close back and forth fight, but it was like biggest fighter possible in the division versus smallest fighter possible in the division. Very close kickboxing match where Farron has absolutely no ground game whatsoever. That was only ever going to be a striking match. Chelsea Chandler on the other side is a bit of a different story. Five and two, and I'm so bad, Wheezy. I'm so bad at betting Chelsea Chandler. <laughs> Because when she first got to the UFC, I was like, oh, baby, you're telling me that this, you know, meathead chick is going to come in here and look for takedowns on Julia Stoliarenko? Click. My girl's going to snap that arm up. Like, oh, no, no, no. She got the break speed off her. Chelsea Chandler, big, mean, powerful, took her down, hurt her. And then I went, you know what? I like this Chelsea Chandler chick. She took out my girl Stoli Aranko. You know what? I'm not the biggest believer in Big Norm. I think she's got some fight IQ issues. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the flyer here on Chelsea Chandler by Big Norm. And then we got one of the best UFC memes you've ever seen with her yeah. sprinting. Full CJ Vergara running away from her opponent in that fight. Just had to get the hell out of there. I, the quote from Dom Cruz still has me just absolutely cackling every time I run that fight back. He's like, guys. That's why they lock the gate. <laughs> like if, if there was no fence there, Chandler would still be running. Like she would just be gone to get away from her opponent. Fight or flight kicked in, and boy, did she fly. She's 33 years old, Wheezy, and she's essentially a Diaz bro. She's big, she's mean, she's very raw, especially at this age and stage of her career. But she's really freaking strong. Physical takedowns. Big ground and pound. She likes to hurt people, and that's an aspect of women's MMA that I personally very much enjoy. She will be six inches taller than Josiane Nunez, so not quite as drastic as the last fight with Sarah Farron, but not too far off either. Surprisingly, Chelsea Chandler will have a one-inch reach advantage in this spot, so one of the few times Nunez doesn't have the longest arms in the cage. And I just, oh my God, this is one of those spots, man, where I'm like, I thought Chelsea Chandler would beat Norma Dumont. I should bet Chelsea Chandler against Josiana Nunez. Like it's that, like it's that A plus B equals C. It should be that easy. Chelsea Chandler's a plus one fifteen underdog, minus one thirty five on Josiana Nunez. But I don't know that I can trust Chandler's fight IQ at this point. Like I said, she just wants to get in there and go to war. And if you're going to get in there and go to war, someone who hits as hard as Nunez is maybe yeah. not the right person to do it. If I got some kind of confirmation that Chandler would grapple in this spot, then it's smash. It's Chandler smash. Like, she'll get on top of this girl. She'll pound her into the ground. She might even submit her. Like, she's going to have such a physicality advantage. Nunez won't be able to do much from her back. But I don't know that Chandler's smart enough to grapple. That's my problem, Wheezy. What do you think of this fight? Man, what I think of this fight is that my money's going to get nowhere near it because I haven't gotten any Josiani Nunez fights wrong. And I, I mean, I, I right, I should say. And, and like Chelsea Chandler, same thing happened to me. I kind of felt like, I think I put a first round submission bet on Stoli Aranko against her. And I was like, oh, that's not going to happen. Wow. She beat seven shades of shit out of Julia Stoli Aranko. <laughs> that, was, that was hard to watch. I mean, that, that was, was rough. She put it on her. And I Julie was like, just decided Whoa. that uh, 135 was best after that fight. <laughs> yes, she did. And, you know, and I was like, damn, this Chelsea Chandler, she's she's mean, you know, like I'm I'm betting her next time. And then, yeah, and she sprints the other way after getting hit hard by Norma. And I was like, boy, I got that one wrong, too. And I, and I mean, I, I'm still I'm gonna, just going to say it in, until I see. Josiani Nunez and Joe Benavidez in the same right room at the same time. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to think that this is the second act in the great combat sports career of one Joe Benavidez because he doesn't want to cut weight anymore down to 125. You know, um, he wants to show off that power that he did, that he couldn't really show off in the men's flyweight division. And, and that's what he's doing here. They're both lefties. I think they have, they both have a 67 inch reach. I mean, stop me when the comparisons, you know, end, you know, I, I don't know <laughs> what we have to do here, just please get them in the same room at the same time. It wouldn't take long. It wouldn't take long. Joe Benavidez is out in that part of the country anyway. I mean, at least just prove it to us. Just, just be like, hey, put your arm around her. Take a picture. Be like, it's not me. Shut up, Wheezy. We can all move on with our lives. But until that picture happens, I'm going to be suspicious, dude. I'm going to be suspicious. Wheezy, but it's never going to beat Uriah Faber and uh, Liz Kamrush. That's Liz Carmouche and Uriah Faber having identical faces is have you seen the picture where they face swap them and it looks more accurate than the real ones? Are you so they like that. they actually like switched the faces and you're like, yeah, <laughs> it's bad, man. <laughs>
Yeah, man. Th- you know, I'm not getting anywhere near this one, and I'm fine with that. That's the great thing about what we do is that the bookies have to make lines. We don't necessarily have to bet them. I don't feel like I have a strong uh, take on this fight. But what I do, what I am, my strong take is that I think this is going to be a really fun fight. Nunez puts on fun fights. Chelsea Chandler's in fun fights. I think they're, they're going to get in the center. They're going to swing, and somebody's probably going to get served here. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you, Weezy. abso freaking lutely All right. We like maybe women's MMA violence, which is a little bit of a, a rare proposition, but this one could be one that we could get talked into there for that. But fun fight nonetheless. Probably best not to put your money on this one. Weezy, I always get sucked into it, man. These low-level women's MMA fights, I always think I've got the angle on them, so I end up betting those more often uh, than maybe some of the more intelligent fights to bet because I think I know what I'm talking about. And uh, it's just so volatile. Be careful. Everybody, you know the drill. Be careful with women's MMA. All right, everybody. We got to shout out the sponsors here real quick. Got a couple of bills to pay. First and foremost, this is the new home of the Die Hard MMA podcast, the home of fight. Please give us a follow here on YouTube if you haven't. Find us on social media. Find us on Twitter X. Find us on Instagram. The posts are awesome. You're going to get that fun, uh, bullshitty type of informational content where you get lots of little stats and facts, funny videos, great content from Home of Fight. On top of that, you're getting betting action these days with Home of Fight picks, the podcast, my stuff, all kinds of other stuff. It's an awesome place to be. And more importantly, guys, I have never until this point actually had a Discord channel. I talked about this the last time, and I'm going to keep reminding you guys. We have a Discord for the Home of Fight, and that is something that I'm going to ask that you guys jump in here and join. Um, I was never super active in the Discord uh, when I was over at Pub. I needed to get a diehard MMA podcast Discord going. People ask me about doing that all the time. I don't really understand Discord. I'm getting better at it. And I'm going to be active here in the Home of Fight Discord. That's where we want people to be. We'll talk fights. Derek Bronson's in there. Gilbert Burns is in there. So people giving out picks, talking, having a good time. Make sure you come and check that out. Home of Fight, baby. Welcome home. All right. Next fight up. We got not next fight, next sponsor up. Sorry. Spectation Sports. Uh, use promo code DIEHARD for Spectation Sports. It's a regional show. We're going to find out a lot about these up and coming fighters here on Spectation Sports. Awesome shows. Maverick, MMA, and All in Combat are both coming up right around the corner. You'll see a lot of faces that we'll see on Dana White's Contender Series coming up soon. So if you're serious about betting regional MMA and or betting Dana White's Contender Series, you're going to want to have this as an asset. Make sure you use Spectation Sports. Fight numbers. My guy John Kelly does fightnumbers.com, and he has offered us diehards a kind and generous discount if you guys want to use his site, Fight Numbers. So use my link here if you guys want to check that out. I've actually won money on back-to-back weeks in DraftKings DFS, which, by the way, I'm fishing a barrel with DFS, Wheezy. I am awful at DFS, and this man has single-handedly made me 15 bucks two weeks in a row, which I know doesn't sound overly impressive, but for me, as opposed to donating every single week, is pretty freaking fun. So check it out. They've got optimizers. They've got analyzers. Um, you can actually put in, like, I don't, I don't think it's AI, but it actually, like, I don't know. Check out the tools on fight numbers, guys. I can't speak to it. I'm not very good at it, but it's a great site with great tools, and my link will get you a discount. The next and final sponsor I want to talk to you about is none other than Bet Freaking Openly, peer-to-peer betting, folks. It's going to give us 1% juice on everything, which means you're saving money left and right because the odds on Bet Openly are better than anything you're going to find literally anywhere else. So let's take a look at these UFC fights. For instance, you can get plus 178 on Danny Silva, where you can lay the same minus 178 on the other side in that fight here. And if you're looking at a site like DraftKings, Joshua Kalibau is minus 185, and you're getting plus 155 on Danny Silva. A giant robbery on either side of that number, but if you go peer-to-peer, you're going to get a better number on both the dog and and the favorite saving that juice on bet openly is going to save us all money as gamblers moving forward. You guys want to join us here, make sure you join the revolution. And uh, on top of that, they've got instant DFS type of props and they just added MMA. So if you want finished props, significant strike numbers, stuff like that, it is also on bet openly. Make sure you check it out guys. We're going to save money and it is the wave of the future when it comes to gambling. Everybody, welcome back to the Home of Fight. This is the Die Hard MMA Podcast, and I'm joined by our favorite stat man himself, Uncle 
Wheezy. Support our guest. He's an awesome follow. He's a real fun guy and does a show himself every single week. Multiple shows, actually. So you're going to want to be there for Wheezy's content. But do me a favor and hit the like button if you want to see me do a shot. We're at 87, folks. We're just 13 away from another shot from Uncle Wheezy and myself if you guys want to see it. Next fight up. The Beast Boy returns. Mike Beast Boy Davis takes on lethal Nathan Levy. And Wheezy, I have a problem. I have a problem. My issue is with Nathan Levy calling himself lethal. In what world is this man lethal? He has zero KOs to his name. He has three wins by submission. And at the UFC level, he has done nothing but grind out some of the boringest decisions I've ever seen in my life. This man shoots takedowns like crazy and can't do a damn thing with him. No ground and pound, no submissions, no nothing. And then he is so big and muscly that deep in the fight, he's exhausted, Wheezy. He banks round one and round two. And then in round three, he does everything he can to stay away from you. And then he double legs you. And as soon as you muster up the energy to get back up to your feet, he does it again. So he's got the worst survival type of status in round three I've ever seen. And it's awful to watch. It's so boring to watch. And you're right there, Wheezy. When you have a Jarno Valdez ticket in your pocket, when you've got a Mike Breedeen ticket in your pocket and it's round three and you can see every single strike hurting this guy and then he hits a double leg. It's the reason I have no hair. I've tried to bet against Natan Levy multiple times, Wheezy, and he just keeps slipping through my fingers. I want to fade this guy so bad. I don't think he's very good. I think he's barely UFC level. And if you're reading the names, listen to that level of competition. He barely survived Jarno Valdez. He barely survived Mike Breedine. We talked about him earlier in the show. He just got cut, and he lost to Hoffa Garcia. Like, this guy is not going to make it, in my opinion at the UFC level. Now, Mike Beast Boy Davis, he's exactly the opposite of Natan Levy. This guy is in, his name fits. He's a beast. 10 and 2, and he's got seven wins by KO. I would say they should flip names, but I actually like Beast Boy as the uh, the nickname here for Mike Davis. <laughs> Beast Boy is my guy, Wheezy. I love this guy. One of my favorite fighters, and it's just so frustrating because he can't seem to get in the octagon. He's had four UFC fights in five years. And that's really the struggle here for me in this spot is just the lack of activity. I think he's had a couple of injury layoffs. Like he's, he's just had some troubles getting in there and it's been tough, but he's a freak athlete, man. He is big. He is extremely strong. He's extremely physical and he really showed off his grappling in his last couple fights. He can bully people around the cage in there. He's got a strong body lock. And when he gets a hold of people, he's the opposite of Nathan Levy yet again. He postures up and he just starts to rip away with ground and pound wheezy. He scores like he actually does damage. And even when you're trying to like work your way back up against the fence, he's pounding you the entire way you're pinned up against that fence. I love this guy. Stupid, durable, great cardio. He averages 3.04 takedowns per 15 minutes with a 53% accuracy. He does have a little bit of a concerning 69% takedown defense rating. Natan Levy probably can hit takedowns on this guy as well. He's hitting takedowns at a 57% accuracy. So Levy probably will hit a takedown or two on Mike Davis. But the deeper this fight goes, I trust both the power and the cardio of Mike Davis. He's a big favorite in this spot, Wheezy. He's the biggest favorite on the card. And frankly, I think it's justified. It's just a bummer that I have to bet against Nathan Levy at this kind of a price. Minus 310 for Beast Boy, plus 250 for Nathan Levy. I like Mike Davis, and I think he'll probably finish him in rounds two or three. Yeah, I tend to agree with you here. Uh, one of the big things we got to talk about with this fight is that Nathan Levy's on a one-year and three-month layoff, and Mike Davis is on almost a one-year and six-month layoff. So these guys haven't been around a cage in a long time. Now, Levy had... Uh, Pete Rodriguez pull out of two fights against him. And then after that, he had a fight uh, scheduled um, uh, that he had to pull out of. Um, so we haven't seen him in over a year. And Davis, Davis, I don't even think had a fight scheduled. Um, I'm going to take a look at that, though, and make sure. But you know, this guy, Davis, he doesn't fight. That's the problem. I mean, like mm -hmm. this guy fights maybe once a year. And I think in his three, like, so he came in. 2019 with uh April of 2019 is when he lost to Burns. 
Then we saw him six months later in October. He beat seven shades of shit out of Thomas Gifford. I don't know how that fight got into the third round. I mean, that was just an absolute beating. Then we don't see him for all of 2020, and then he fights at the beginning of 2021. Year and three months off, he beats Mason Jones. Then we don't see him for a year and nine months. He beats Borshev. Now here we are, and it's a year and a half later. What is this guy doing, man? I don't know how many and how don't how many injuries there have been. He pulled out of a Giga Chikadze fight, injury Davis. Pulled out of a Giga Chikadze fight three months later. Davis withdrew. He beats Mason Jones. Then he's scheduled to fight Jay Herbert. Davis withdrew. Seven months later, fig, gonna fight Medic. Medic withdrew, and then Borshev steps in for Medic. And then now here we are a year and a half later against Levy. So with minus 310 for a guy that we haven't seen in a year and a half, um, coming off a shoulder surgery from what I understand, I understand he had a bike accident on the way to the gym. Shoulder surgery for a guy who boxes as well as Mike Davis, a little bit concerning. The layoff is a little bit concerning. But, I mean, where is Natan Levy better than this guy? Nowhere. Not a single yeah. spot that I can identify, Weezy. Yeah, I mean, I even think if we're being really objective, I mean, it's kind of hard to find anything, really, that this guy is going to be better than Mike Davis at. Mike Davis is taller. He's three inches taller. He's got a one-inch reach advantage. He's a little bit younger. He's got more overall experience. He's got more UFC experience. He's without question the more explosive athlete and the more powerful striker. High-level New York wrestling background, this guy. And he trained at Customato's gym. Under Mike Tyson's trainer, Rooney, for five different years between the ages of 14 and 19, he's one of these guys that has such an all-around base that, like, I'll bet everybody who knew who Mike Davis was when he first started uh, in mixed martial arts was trying to be the guy that was going to train this prospect because he has all the tools, the athleticism, the size, the boxing, the wrestling, the power, and a BJJ black belt. So. That's why this number is so wide right here with him coming off an 18-month layoff. And Clint, you know this. I know this. It's that time of year. See, us MMA gamblers who do this all year long, you know, where this is our number one sport and we stick with it all year long. You know, it's like having a nice pool with a bunch of responsible people from the neighborhood. Adults, Clint, you know, good, wholesome honest people who like to go to the pool, who like to get some sun, not have punk kids running around all over the place, <laughs> screwing up the pool, you know, being loud, playing shitty music, you know. But what happens? Every year, right around the beginning of February, when football ends, all these people who were betting on football, who were betting on basketball, who were betting on hockey, now that the seasons are ending for basketball and hockey right now, but especially once football ends, all these unruly kids come in the pool and they fuck up our good time. We call them the parlay <laughs> boys, you know? And what they do is they look at the lot, the lines and they say, if anybody's over minus 200, they're automatically winning. I'm throwing them in my parlay. And then before you know it, you're out there on your floater. It's a beautiful sunny day, but you got a bunch of kids playing Marco Polo around you. They're bumping into you. There's somebody, you know, like, there's people drinking at the, and they're getting wasted. The, the, the moms are, are on Instagram instead of watching their punk ass kids who are running around like they don't have any goddamn manners. And then all of a sudden, Javid Basharat is minus 900 on the money line. And then we're all wondering <laughs> what happened to our beautiful pool, Clint, you know, and that that's something that we have to be very aware of this time of year. And, and, and believe me, once basketball and hockey gets uh, is done, it's going to get even worse. So we got to watch easy. out for these parlay boys because they're pushing these lines too far, Clint. They're screwing up my pool. Stay off my fucking lawn, you know, and let me be in my nice pool, my responsible adults who know how to do regular math and know what the price of something should be. So we got to be careful about parlaying certain people this time of year because we might not be getting the best prices and we might not be making good long-term decisions that will help us be long-term profitable gamblers in the end. That's fair, Uncle Weezy. That's absolutely fair. 
I think I still might take the plunge, though. I know Beast Boy is a little bit inflated at this point, but like I mentioned before, man, I have a hard time identifying where Nathan Levy is better than him at all. If he's healthy, and I know he's had a couple surgeries, if he's at all healthy, he wins this fight, Wheezy. So yeah. I like my Beast Boy Davis, and uh, do with that what you will. Dixon Sider says, the Chalk Donkeys. Yes, we all we all know the Chalk Donkeys. All right, everybody. Next up, you've got Gerald freaking Mearshart, GM3 himself, taking on none other than Brian Barbarena. And, and Wheezy, you know, I've talked a lot on this podcast, and I always like to kind of kick it off with, like, my thoughts. You know, it's one of those things where it's, not, it's no disrespect to my guests, but, like, it's my show. I'm going to start with what I think, and, you know, we'll go from there. You can tell me if I'm wrong to my face if you think so, and that makes the show fun, and that's great. But I don't know what the fuck to do with this fight, Wheezy. I have not had a good read on Gerald Mearshart at all. I do not know what to do with this man when it comes to betting him in the UFC. And I don't really know what to do with his opponent here either. I've had such a bad read on Barbarana. I don't know why he's staying up a weight class at this point. He damn near retired from the sport of MMA and Dana White offered him a bag. So he was like, oh, okay, I'll take another fight. So he did that and then he did it again. And now he's doing it yet again up at 185. He's not built for this weight class. He's small. Gerald Mearshart is kind of, I hate to say it, but maybe coming into the, to the end of his run here in MMA, he's taken such a beating, so much damage. He's the naturally larger guy. He's got the submission upside here. But Brian Barbarena is that kind of guy that just doesn't quite ever fuck off. Like, he'll always be there. Gerald Mearshart round three is a must bet, like, every time he steps foot inside the cage. But besides that, I don't know what the hell to do, man. This is such a weird and tough fight for me to call. Gerald is a minus 245 favorite, and that sounds suspect. You get plus 200 on Brian Barbarena, but do I want Brian Barbarena up at 185 who just gave up 27 takedowns to uh, to freaking, what's his name? The the worst uh, of the UFC. Muradov, thank you. Yeah. He just gave up like 17 takedowns to Muradov in his last fight. If Gerald Mearshart gets more than two, I think he's probably in trouble. Like, it's such a weird fight, man. Like, all of that leads me to believe that Gerald Mearshart has taken this guy down and tapping him out. But the little hairs on the back of my neck are like, Barb's going to hit him in the face and hurt him. Like, I don't know why, but like, I feel like Barb is a live dog at two to one. Again, no analysis. This makes zero sense for me to think that. But I, I kind of think Barb is just going to, you know, grit his teeth and keep punching until he somehow wins. I don't know. What, what do you make of this fight, Weezy? Tell me, tell me something that makes sense. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I wish I could because, like, one of the things that that first comes to mind is how can you tell me that Brian Barbarena gives a shit anymore if he's fighting at 185 pounds? This is a guy that I always thought could make 155, you know, and, and he always looked kind of, you know, like a little bit fat, you know, MMA fat, you know, not sure. like regular American, not like me fat. fat. Yeah, yeah, not like me <laughs> fat either, you know. I mean, I mean, this is America. We know fat people, you know, and. Brian Barbarain is not a fat man, but in MMA, there's a completely different standard, you know, because these guys cut a ton of weight. And part of this sport is the fact that, yeah, you cut that much weight because if you don't, you're going to be fighting much bigger dudes who hit a lot harder. And, you know, most of these dudes are on steroids anyway, you know, so like you and they you outweigh better... you by 20 pounds by fight night. Dude, some of these dudes at 205 are walking into the cage at 240. You know, so, so, you know, like somebody like Mearshart, you know, I mean, like that guy never sees, he sees 185 pounds twice a year when he, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then the rest of the time that dude's walking around at 220, I would say minimum 220. He's a huge guy, that guy's six foot one with a 77 inch reach. So, um, you know, I, I don't think Brian's taking the shit seriously, dude. You know, I remember when they made the fight with Muradov, I thought to myself, holy shit. Muradov's moving down to 170, you know, and then I looked at UFC stats. They had it listed at middleweight. I looked at Tapology, They had it listed at middleweight. And when I created the stat sheet for my Patreon members, I put it as welterweight because I was like, there is no fucking way that Brian Barbarena is going to be taking fights in the UFC at 185 when he's getting his ass shaved at 170. You know, it doesn't get better up there. Those dudes at 185 are mean, you know? Um, 
so how does Brian win this fight? A guy that's allowing 4.15 takedowns for 15 minutes to a guy who has as many wins by submission in his career as Brian has fights? I mean, dude, Mearshart's got 27 wins by submission. Brian Barbarena has a 49% takedown defense. Do you need a statistics major from the Harvard of the Midwest, Northern Illinois University, to tell you that that is a bad combination of statistics, <laughs> you know, for, for Brian Barbarina's potential outcome for this fight? No, you don't. You know, so even though Mearshart isn't this guy that's a D1 wrestler or anything like that, he's pretty much the opposite. He's more of a BJJ guy. He, he's not a great wrestler, but you don't have to be a great wrestler to get this guy, Barbarina, down. And even if he's not a great wrestler, He's way taller than Barbarina. He's got a five-inch reach advantage. He kicks a lot more than Barbarina, so he should be able to maintain range and actually land some shots from the outside and maybe even win some minutes on the feet here. He he lands with some power, Mearshart does, especially with those body kicks. But that opposite stance body kick, because Mearshart's a southpaw, isn't going to work in this fight because Barbarina is also a southpaw. So... I mean, I guess it's an interesting stylistic matchup, but I'm not in the habit of laying juice on a guy like Gerald Mearshart. And yeah. I, I am not going to take the dog shot on Brian Barbarena because I don't think he belongs at this weight class. I think he's fine at 170. He's got a good style for that weight class. A lot of pressure, a lot of volume, good durability, walks you down, forces a fight, and he finds out how much you want to be there. At 185, you're not stomping these dudes. You know, like you could... You know, somebody like Barbarina is probably not knocking out a, a whole lot of 185 pounders at, at the UFC level. So I'm not sure how he wins this fight. It should be Gerald, but I'm not going to be getting to a bet on this one. I hear you, Weezy. I hear you. And it's tough because, like you mentioned with Barbie, he, he's a guy that rolls in almost out of shape every fight. So, like, you can't even wait for weigh-ins and be like, maybe he'll look better. Like, no, he's going to be big and flabby at 185. Like, he's not – even if he prepared for this fight, he's still not going to have abs. Like, he's never had abs. Yeah. So, it, it's real tough if you're going to look to take the live dog shot on this one. I, I maybe – I hate to say it, but it's another spot where you could look live. You know? It's another spot where you could look live. Unfortunately, if Barbarena is competing in this fight, that number is going to drop like a stone, man. That plus 200 is going to be gone. I think Gerald Mearshart is a plus money guy for me. I want GM three when he's getting plus one thirty, plus one forty. Like that's where I want GM three to come out there and be that dog that shows the heart and digs deep and and gets it done late in the fight that he probably shouldn't have won. I'm not laying chalk on that guy. It's a tough spot, Wheezy. It really is. Uh, Dixon Cider here. You guys are killing me. Ethan Hershey says we need three more likes for shots. And I check, Wheezy, and there's some spiteful bitches in this chat because somebody unliked it. We're five away, everybody. If you, oh my want, God. Us, if you want us to do a shot, we are five likes away from 100 on the video. And that's freaking hilarious that we got that close and somebody was like, nope. <laughs> It's Brian Barbarina. He's in here being like, oh, I'm a good middleweight. What the hell is Wheezy talking about? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dixon likes the uh, split decision prop. I don't mind that. And uh, Super actually with a really good point in here. Barbarina hurt a lot of people with his hands, including dropping Leon. And really, guys, the chin of one Gerald Mearshart has really kind of been my biggest issue with him recently. That's a guy that I do not want to go – uh, I do not want to lay chalk on mostly because of a durability issue. I think that's a big problem for GM three and the older he gets, the worse it gets, but Weezy, we got business to take care of because we got a couple more fights to talk about and we hit a hundred likes, baby. So you guys that's have dope. earned it. We will go ahead and get you another shot. Dixon cider, letting us know that it is in fact shot time. Let's go. Let's go, right. man. Cheers. Uncle Weezy. Absolutely. Cheers, Cheers to you. Here's to some profitability yes. in MMA. Let's go. Let's make some money. Woo. Oh, you guys are punishing me now. That's good. Here's the thing. If you guys haven't ever drank Fireball before, and I know I get a lot of shit for it, there's a story behind it. I've told it before. We didn't have time. We've already wasted too much of this show with tangents, but I'll tell you that story again one of these days. There's a reason I drink Fireball, but Wheezy, oh, it is hot ass when it's fire. When, it, when it's warm. Oh, yeah. If you have ice cold straight out of the freezer chilled fireball, oh, it's good. It is real good. Real nice crispy cinnamon breath. 
But if it's room temperature, this shit is rancid. It's been sitting here for damn near two hours while we do this show. So you guys are really killing me with this bullshit right about now. <laughs> yeah, I, I like room temperature tequila. It's it's a nice, you know, I sip it. I enjoy it. You know, the Mexicans know what they're doing when it comes to their alcohol. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yes, sir. And you guys get a bonus shot. Wheezy over here double dipping just because he feels like it. That's what's up. Next fight up, Fiani Khan's dad takes on Macy Chesson. And uh, Wheezy, I I've got a little story here about Macy Chesson. You know, she got a big, big win for me over none other than Big Norm, Norma Dumont. You know, I, I had a nice plus money ticket on her, and she went to the grappling hard in that fight. She won it with cage control. Control. she got some late takedowns it was super close but she got it done for me and i cashed some plus money and people were real upset about it that was at ufc phoenix wheezy that was right here in my backyard i was live at that fight i was screaming my head off and as macy is like coming down the runway to go ahead and go back in i ran down to the front and i got my phone out and i'm like Macy, I'm like, let me take a picture. Like, I wanted to do a selfie. I wanted to celebrate with her. And Wheezy, she didn't look my way once. Now, she does happen to be interested in women. So not that she's a man hater necessarily, but about five feet that way, this chick comes running down and goes, Macy, Macy. She stops right in front of me, heel turns, and goes over and takes a picture with her. I was like, that bitch. Oh, damn. <laughs> I was like, you kidding me? Macy, like, I'm cheering for you. I just want to bet on you. I've told <laughs> everybody how underrated, and she absolutely dogged me. Now, she wow. obviously, she doesn't know that, <laughs> that I was supporting her like that, but it was like... <laughs> Damn, man. Like, come on now. I felt real bad about that one. So, um, you know, she, I'm a fan of Macy's. You know, she's working out at Forest MMA. She's a training partner with my girl, Sam Hughes. I'm not going to throw shade. I'm not going to turn heel on Macy. She's been good to me. Uh, and honestly, man, I, I like Macy Chesson. I like her frame. I like her style. She's got good side to side footwork. She doesn't have a ton of power, but she does have that kind of classic Fortis MMA grind in her she will fight her ass off and unless you finish her she's gonna keep going she might get hurt in the first round of a fight but she'll dig deep and start grappling she might lose a couple of minutes of round two but she'll dig deep and she'll bite down and she'll throw back like she i like the tenacity that i see out of macy chason and and i think that's something um that she can put to use as she develops and as she gets better and, and honestly i think her game plan going from being mostly just a striker to being more of a grappler has really benefited her so i kind of like the career trajectory right now for macy chason piani kanzad they call her bonsai um She's just so middle of the road to me, man. She's only 32 years old, so she's still young. She can make improvements. She can get there, but she's two and two in her last four fights, and she's a bit of a slow starter. Being a slow starter, we've seen that bite people in the ass a lot. That was a big talking point with Piotr Jan last week, uh, but she really has a hard time unless she gets in the flow state. Now, once she gets in the flow state, Wheezy, like Piani Kinzad is a beastly striker when she gets in that flow state if she gets to the point where she's comfortable she's got the rhythm she's got the timing she'll beat your ass it's keeping her out of that and i actually think the takedowns of macy chess on is something that will do that and even just that threat of the takedown reminding her that oh you can't get comfortable i'm gonna grab your leg like that's exactly the kind of thing that i think will bother and break the flow of piani kenzad um she's got a nasty lead left hook she does keep that high tight boxing shell, which I think will open up the legs and the body. And she gets a little bit predictable the deeper the fight goes. You know, you look at her numbers and she's got a 71% takedown defense rating. But when you watch that fight with Vieira Weezy, those takedowns came easy. I mean, for somebody who's got that upwards of 70% takedown defense, you would expect to see a little bit of resistance. But when Vieira wanted her down, she was on her back. like It was like that. There was no resistance whatsoever. I think Macy Chesson is a good spot here. I think she can win this fight. I think she can grapple if she wants to. I think she can hang on the feet. It's women's MMA, so it's probably going to be tighter than you'd like it to be. But I think she's the side. I'm a little bit disappointed because 
before the show, Macy Chiasson was right around minus 170. And I felt like that was probably a playable number straight. She's minus 205 now, Wheezy. Somebody dropped a bomb. Like when this when this podcast went live, somebody saw the same thing I'm seeing and said, you know what? It's time to get in on Macy Chiasson. And now she's minus 205. That number's a little bit gross. But again, I, I really just think it makes sense. I, I think she's got a lot of advantages in this fight. She's at a good gym. She's working with good people. She's improving. I like Macy here. What are you doing? Yeah, I like Macy too. I, I, Macy's been somebody that's been disrespected by the betting markets for a while, and as a result of that, I've been <laughs> betting on her. You I'm know, squeezy, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mushroom, Mushroom says you should have shown Macy your fireball. She would have thought you had a vagina. <laughs> Walk up to her with a squash alley cat and a chocolate choo choo. Be like, I am <laughs> such a fan. You know, and like she would have. She would have been like, oh, my God, an ally, you know. But, yeah, it, you know, <laughs> he's not going to make friends with us. But that's all right, man. We can still profit off of Macy's fights, you know. I mean, that's the oh most important God. thing here, you know. <laughs> you, got, you got to love having Mushroom in here. He can always oh. he can always make the show more entertaining without even having to be on the screen. I'm sorry for interrupting, Weezy. You go, you go oh, right ahead, man. Mushroom. You're killing me. Please do if it's going to be with with gems <laughs> like that. But um, yeah. I, so I bet on Macy against Raquel. That did not work out for me. I bet on Norma uh, on her against Norma Dumont. That went very well. And then, oh boy, I bet on her against Irene Aldana. Got a oh, nice no. juicy plus money number there at plus one seventy. And then check this out, Clint, for the for the for the kick in the dick. That 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 adds to this. I also had the over two and a half parlayed up. Oh and no! She gets liver kicked from the bottom with two twenty into the round, and the fight finishes about five seconds before that went over. So that liver kick not only cost me my plus one seventy ticket on Chase on with in a fight that she was winning, um, it also killed a two leg parlay, which was going to be a big winner for me had that fight went over two and a half rounds. So. That oh, one, like, amazing. I'll never forget that liver kick. That was one of the, the, you know, like, how the hell do I lose bets like this? You know, <laughs> like you yep. say to yourself, does 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 gambler, the gambling god, hate me? You know, is he trying to make a point right now? Because who's ever lost an over 2.5 and a nice juicy fat plus money ticket as a result of an up kick to the liver from the back? I mean, it's just one of those things, but. Look, I lost the same money line ticket, Wheezy. I was right there with you, and yeah. I was actually going to mention that pain when it circled back to me, but I can't I can't hold a candle to you losing both of those. I wasn't double dipped on it. That is brutal. That was a rough one, dude. I remember I was on the Pub Sports watch along, and I was like, I mean, my jaw just dropped, and I was silent for about three minutes. I was like, no, there's no way. Not like this happened. It was horrible. <laughs> um, so these, these two have already fought before, Clint. They fought at 145. It was the uh it was the ultimate fighter finale. And at 145, Penny's got no chance against Macy because Macy's huge for the division. Five she's foot big. eleven, five foot eleven, and she's making 135 pounds. That's crazy. You know, uh 72 inch reach. We got to see Macy on the scales. We have to see Macy on the scales, especially if you're going to lay this kind of juice on her. I think she's better than Panny. She's got a lot more power on the feet. But what I think that she can really just do is grab a hold of Panny, put her back on that cage, land some dirty boxing, some nice elbows in the clinch there, get an inside trip, get, get an outside reap, foot sweep, something to get her ass down on that mat get on top of her and land some good ground and pound. I like Macy here. She's a tough girl. She's huge for the weight class. She has power on the feet. She can win minutes on the in the clinch. She can win minutes with her grappling game. I'm a big fan of hers, and I like having money on Macy Chase on. She's a solid fighter, um, and I think that this is a good matchup for her because I don't think she's going to fight Panny's fight. I don't think she's just going to stand at distance with her and allow her to be in a point fighting battle with somebody like Panny that stays very busy, uh, attempting 15.78 distance strikes per minute spent at distance, 45% accuracy, positive 1.68 distance striking differential. These are all the numbers of somebody that can win minutes at distance. I don't think Macy should play that game with her. And I, I think if she does choose to fight her fight instead of Panny's fight, that she's probably going to look minus 200 here. Yeah, and she is minus 200, so hopefully she does look minus 200, Wheezy. I'm honestly tempted, guys, on a little bit of a parlay here. 
Um, I know we talked about the line being a little wide, but I, I actually think Mike Davis and Macy Chase on might be a decent move here. It's minus 104, and that might be a play that I make here on this card. Shout out our guy Lou in the chat. Boo, Lou Betcha. My guy probably still in Twitter jail, though. I don't know what happened to you, my guy. Free but, Lou uh, Betcha. Open, Hoping you get the account back sooner than later. Uh, good to see you here in the chat. Thank you very much for uh, hanging out. Rusty saying, gotta go. Thank you, guys. Love the show. I added that. Thank you, guys, myself, Rusty. Appreciate you, my guy. Hope you circle back around to listen to the last couple fights here on the card. Thanks for being with us. Next flight up, my guy, Christian Rodriguez. C-Rod himself takes on Isaac Tulgarian. Weezy. This is, I think, where we are going to do battle. I believe that this is the Twitter MMA Civil War of the week. I think we're going to go back and forth on this exact fight, Wheezy, because these guys are very, very closely matched, and there's a lot of opinions on both sides of this fight. Now, let's just get started with none other than my guy, C. Rod, the O-Taker himself. I've been riding this man, Wheezy. No homo. Christian Rodriguez, 10 and 1. And you know who that loss was to? A short notice UFC debut against Jonathan Pierce, one of the best grapplers the division has to freaking offer. Since he lost that fight, and he damn near choked out JSP in that fight, by the way, in the very first yeah. round, he has rattled off three wins in a row. He came out against Joshua Weems, and he handled that boy. Round one sub. He handled Raul Rosas Jr., made him look like the 17-year-old that he is, and then he came out against Cameron Simon Weezy. And he made me look like a genius because when the rumors started percolating that maybe he would fight Cameron Simon, I put my money where my mouth was, Weezy. We talked about planting your flag earlier in the show and how stupid you can look when you do that. But I said that Christian Rodriguez submits Cameron Simon if they book that fight. And you would not imagine the amount of hate that came back at me for making that statement. Now, he didn't submit Cameron Simon, so I was close, but he beat the brakes off that kid and showed everybody there's levels to this game. Christian Rodriguez is so much better than anybody gives him credit for, and he's just 26 years old. You guys keep thinking that he's a throwaway Dana White's contender series type kid that's being put in there to buff up the resume of somebody else when C-Rod is actually the prospect. He's being taken under the wing by the Pettis bros. Like he's out there at Rufus Sport learning how to box. Since he lost to JSP, he called up Santiago and he has joined forces with the fight ready boys. I mean, our guy Brandon Olivas is good buddies with him and they train mm -hmm. regularly together now. Like he's doing everything he can to improve and to get better and to advance. And he is knocking off guys that were supposed to be something. And he still just doesn't get the respect of a guy that's a legitimate threat in this weight class. And Weezy, I simply do not understand it. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting. C-Rod has had a tough time making weight. All right. So admittedly, he's missed, he's missed weight a couple of times. He's moving up to 145 pounds, and they are tossing him Isaac Dulgarian. Dulgarian is 6 and 0. Oh, and this one pains me a little bit because, as much of my boy as C Rod is, I actually really like Isaac Dulgarian. They're doing it to me again, Wheezy. Whenever you get like two hot young up and coming prospects and you're fans of both of them, you're hoping they don't meet each other until they're contenders. You're hoping they don't meet each other until there's a top 10 spot on the line. But they're killing me here because I love Isaac Dolgarian and I want to support this guy. In fact, both these guys are mutual follows of mine on social media because I've buddied up with both of them. I like both these guys as prospects. Dolgarian is a beast. Every single fight he's ever been in, he's finished in round one. Six and oh, two round one subs four round TKOs, and let's not forget his four fight amateur career, which also has four and O oh to the round one finish. This guy's a fucking beast. He's like a D2 wrestler who's a finalist when he was like a sophomore or some shit. Like freshman. he's in true freshman. Freshman. Okay, true freshman. Yes. And he yes. final he was a finalist. Like that's yeah. impressive as hell. Mm -hmm. And he's a brick shit house, Wheezy. Like this yeah. guy is muscled like you've never seen. And he hits hard. 
like he blasts doubles people. He runs across the cage and picks them up and sets them on their ass like they're nothing and gets on top of them and goes to work with elbows. The elbows that he landed on Francis Marshall just opened his face up with like two shots. He is so nasty with his ground and pound. The problem for me, Wheezy, is that Christian Rodriguez is a scrambler. You go back and you watch that JSP fight. And like I mentioned, it was on short notice up at 145. Short notice. And he had 15 minutes of cardio to go with a guy like JSP who tires everybody out. Yeah. Like you gas out and break against JSP. But this kid on short notice scrambled with him that entire time and almost submitted him on three separate situations. Like C-Rod's guillotine is nasty his cardio is not to be counted out his boxing is decent and he took jsp's back on multiple occasions and almost locked in a rear naked choke not even a guillotine just catching him coming in but like straight up reversed got dominant position and almost tapped him this is a spot where i am afraid i'm afraid i very much am afraid because i know exactly what isaac Vilgarian is capable of and something I've noticed, you guys, when you get a dog where the secret's out, I scream from the mountaintops that C-Rod is the fucking man. And no one wanted to hear it. I cashed plus money tickets on this guy. Like, there were nothing. Popping candy. And everyone couldn't get it. Now they know. He's knocked off two big-time prospects. Now they all know. And the bookies go, hey, here's plus money. Yeah. That terrifies me to my core, Wheezy. The secret is out. Everyone knows how good C-Rod is. They know he's not to be underestimated mm -hmm. in this spot. And the bookies are more than willing to offer up plus money on him again. Isaac Dilgarian's a minus 175 favorite. Plus 145 on Christian Rodriguez. And I'm battling with myself. Because we don't really know anything about Dolgarian outside of three minutes. Yeah. We don't know if his cardio holds up for a 15-minute fight. We don't know if he's durable. We don't know if he's a good hammer or a bad nail. We know all those things about Christian Rodriguez. But we know Dolgarian's a motherfucker in round one. I mean, Dolgarian's gonna take down C-Rod, guys. He, in round one, he is going to put Christian Rodriguez on his back. Now, C-Rod knows how to move. He knows how to scramble. He knows how to buck. He won't accept bottom position. And Wheezy, I think that's kind of the key here because most of the people that Dolgarian has faced and beaten and TKO'd and left in bloody puddles, he gets on top of them and they lay on their back and he pins them down and then he beats the brakes off of them from that position. Christian Rodriguez is not going to do that. Christian Rodriguez is going to make Isaac Dolgarian work for every single one of those positions, and he will not accept a bottom position. Now, he's had since his last fight to prepare for this one at 145, which makes a huge difference. This is not short notice at 145, Wheezy. This is I've worked out at 145. This is I've put on muscle at 145. This is I have trained to be ready at 145 pounds. So I'm going to still give the cardio advantage to Christian Rodriguez. The other questions in this fight are massive. Obviously, Dulgarian's got the power advantage. Obviously, Dulgarian has the wrestling advantage. I would argue submission upside goes to C-Rod. But we don't know about cardio. We don't really know about durability. And that makes me nervous. I think Christian Rodriguez is super live to catch his patented guillotine in this spot. Especially because we know Dulgarian's going to hit a blast double leg on him. And then I think the cardio of Christian Rodriguez is something that absolutely can prevail in this spot because he will make Isaac Dolgarian work like he's never worked before. If Dolgarian can't lock him down, can he recover and catch his air from that top position? Will he be able to settle his heart rate? And then once they get back up to the feet, we know Christian Rodriguez is going to be right in his face. Does Dolgarian have that one hitter quitter power on the feet to crack a guy that's as durable as C-Rod and just end him? Or will the volume of C-Rod on the feet once he's back up there make the difference? I think it's round one, Dolgarian. And if he doesn't finish it, I think Christian Rodriguez is going to put on a classic performance where he takes over the deeper the fight goes. I think C-Rod can hand one more man his O, oh, Wheezy. I know the bookies are laying the groundwork. I know the bookies want all of the money. I know the Sharps are all piling in on Isaac Dolgarian. I have not bet this fight yet, Wheezy, because the number is getting 
wider, but y'all should have known walking into this show that Christian Rodriguez is the link memorial dog of the week. If the bookies have set a bear trap, I don't care. I'm stepping right in it and I'll saw my leg off when it's over. My man C-Rod is taking me to the bank one more time. Wait for this line to peak. Get as much plus money as you can and keep an eye out for that submission prop because if Isaac Dilgarian gets tired, Wheezy, I think he's tough enough. I think he's durable enough. He's not going to get knocked out, but boy, will he get exhausted. And those guys, they tap. They tap out. Christian Rodriguez, round three, submission. That's the call, Wheezy. That's what I'm going with this week. How do you like this fight, man? I love the breakdown, and I love the fight even more. I mean, this is a phenomenal fight, and it absolutely has to be the Twitter war of the week because how could it not be, right? We know so much more about Christian Rodriguez, right? He's been in this position before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Dixon said it in, in the chat earlier. He goes, you know, how many, how many multiple times state champion wrestlers has C-Rod beaten? Actually, one. His name is Junior Cortez. He's trained with the Cejudo brothers since he was a kid. He is a multiple-time Arizona State wrestling champion. And C-Rod stopped the takedowns from that cat, kept it on the feet, and beat, beat the shit out of him on the feet, right? So he has fought him yeah, multiple times. Fuck your times state championship. Champion Cejudo's in the gym. World champion gold medalist wrestler. <laughs> yes. I mean, and that's who the Cortezes have been training with since they were kids was with the Cejudo brothers. Angel was coaching them, and they were in the gym with Henry, you know? So these guys, we know about Christian Rodriguez. And if you listen to all the, the UFC fights, a lot of times they had Paul Felder calling those fights, and Felder was in the gym with Christian Rodriguez talking about how good this guy was, talking about how Christian would give him problems on the feet, a bantamweight. And, and Felder's admitting that this guy gave me problems on the feet. He's a really good boxer. But as good as Christian Rodriguez is at MMA, Isaac Dolgarian is that good at wrestling. And look, there are three disciplines of wrestling, and they call it the triple crown or something like that when you win. Like Darren Elkins, when he was in Indiana, he was winning state championship for freestyle, state championship for Greco-Roman over and over again. And there's he, he was four-time state champion in both, right? Dolgarian won the other one too, because there's 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 freestyle, there's I think folk, and then there's you know uh Greco Roman. He won all three. This guy is a wrestling savant. Um, he eventually uh he's a three-time state champion, but according to um Daniel Cormier, he should have been a four-time state champion because he was disqualified in the finals for a move that Daniel Cormier said he should not have been disqualified for. Mm -hmm. This guy, Dolgarian, is the real deal, he's okay. phenomenal. He is absolutely phenomenal, and there's a reason why the Sharps are on this guy, right? There's a reason why Christian Rodriguez, after beating Raul Rosas Jr., after beating Cameron Simon, after going three hard rounds with Jonathan Pierce, after beating Reyes Cortez on Dana White's Contender Series, after knocking out Haralambos uh, Gregorio in CFFC, why he's an underdog to this guy. And that's because when you watch the tape on Dalgarian, there's nobody that deserves to be in the cage with this guy thus far. You know, he, they're going to have to start giving him way better opponents because what he's doing to these lower level opponents is horrible. <laughs> it's so one sided. It's so dominant. But we, we, there's just so many questions. What does he look like in the second round? And the thing about wrestlers is a wrestling match is eight minutes long, seven minutes long in some situations, depending on whether you're in college or high school. It's a different level of conditioning, right? Going hard for seven minutes is not the same as going hard for 15 minutes, especially yeah, when you have to blend all the disciplines, the boxing, the cage wrestling, the clinch striking, the takedowns, the ground game, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It all gets mixed together. I'm picking Christian Rodriguez to win the fight, but it's with very little confidence because I know how good Dalgarian is. But here's the play. This guy, Dolgarian's never seen a second round. Never. How, how the hell is the under two and a half rounds at minus 105? Are we pretending like Christian Rodriguez isn't a finisher? 
I think that's what's happening, Wheezy. I think it's because his last couple of fights have gone the distance, and the bookies are looking at that and going, oh, he can't finish anybody. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I think he's fought two tough and durable guys. And frankly, he gave up positions where he probably could have gotten a submission. He just makes no mistakes. He, he is yeah. willing to take a decision instead of getting a finish if it means winning the fight. And I'm with you. I, I think if Isaac Dilgarian slows down, C-Rod will end him. So... I think the bookies are maybe offering a little bit of a softball here on this uh, on this total because I, I do think we could see an under here also as well. I think the people that are betting this over have it wrong, you know, and I think it's easier to be a little bit more opinionated on the total on this fight than it is on the money line because both of these guys are phenomenal. You yeah. can make a phenomenal argument for why Christian Rodriguez is going to win and for how Delgarian is going to win, and both of them hold water. Both of them are sound arguments with with Rodriguez he's more experienced he's definitely more well-rounded we know he's the better striker right if if Isaac Delgarian were to go out there and outstrike Christian Rodriguez it would be a completely unpredictable event nobody's predicting that right we know that Rodriguez has got fought the tougher dudes I mean come on this guy Delgarian was fighting O and O guys in NAC OK, his best win before he got to the UFC was TJ or Terry Britton, you know, and that guy is not good. Before that, Ostrander, Ebrecht, Moody, Moody 0 and 0, Ebrecht 1 and 2. I think Ostrander might have been 1 and 0. These guys are all cans, you know. So he got that beautiful win over Francis Marshall, a phenomenal win. But I'm going with the total, man. If this guy's never been out of round one in his entire career, if he's such a phenomenal finisher and front-loaded early in fights, I'll take that under 2.5 at minus 105 and be fine with it. Because if this thing gets out of the first, all bets are off. We have no idea what Del what Delgarian's going to look like in that situation. So I, instead of planting my flag on the Rodriguez money line or the Delgarian money line, I'm planting my flag on that under. I don't mind that one bit, Wheezy. I really don't. Because if Isaac Delgarian is who he is and he keeps doing what he does and maybe he's just too much for C-Rod at 145 pounds, yeah, he probably does what he keeps doing, right? Like he probably gets him out of there in, in round one or two also. But on the flip side, if he does tire and gas, then C-Rod is going to have more than enough opportunity to get an exhausted wrestler who doesn't have an answer for being on his own back out of there in the second or the third. I, I like that. I don't mind violence in this spot. Two and a half could be the spot. Now, of course, with you and I agreeing on this, um, we're going to end up getting a Dolgarian decision. <laughs> 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 he's, he's just going to sit on C-Rod's chest for 15 straight minutes right after we say how much value is on both the other sides of those outcomes. So, Bear, everybody get ready for that because that's probably what's coming now. <laughs> it certainly could, man, but these guys are so well matched, and in my opinion, uh, this is the highest level fight on the card. Absolutely. These guys are phenomenal, both of them. Dolgarian, phenomenal. C-Rod, phenomenal. This is a great great fight and i am looking forward to this one more than anything else on the card such a fun fight and i'm excited for c-rod man because this fight will tell us if he needs to get his shit together and go back down to 135 or if he can make a home for himself at 145 because i think this is this will be a big big difference maker for that does he take the frankie edgar approach where he's smaller and lighter and faster and the cardio pays um, or does he need to have that size advantage and go down a weight class and, and be able to be, you know, bully people physically the way that he did? It's going to be very interesting to watch this one play out. Yeah. Um, one unit play, guys. I'm going to back my guy C Rod because I'm ride or die with C Rod. It's the exact same situation as Song Yudong last week. Um, I did double down on Song, and that was a mistake. I was playing a small bet on him very intentionally. And then as the week went on, I kind of talked myself into, hey, I've got a bigger plus money number now. Why don't I double down? I shouldn't have done that. I should have kept it just kind of a one unit play. I'm going to do that with C Rod this week. I love both these guys. But C-Rod is my guy of the two of them. He's my guy to watch. I've made money on him. I'm ride or die. I'm going to keep betting him until I lose. So it's a one-unit play because it's a very, very dangerous spot for him. So we're going to wait until this number peaks. We'll throw one unit on C-Rod and then just see what happens. I'll be rooting for my boy. Next up, we've got Kennedy and Chukwu taking on Ovince oh, St. Pru. And I thought OSP had retired, Weezy. I really thought he was already done. I he thought did he retire. Actually he okay, retired he did. six years ago. He just hasn't I'm not crazy. told us yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I was like, I swear this guy was off the off the freaking payroll at this point. 
Oh my gosh. Wheezy, I, I hate this fight. I hate this fight so much because I, once again, have been the one pounding my chest and screaming from the mountaintops that Kennedy in Chukwu, Nizichukwu, I'm not sure if you'd say the Z or not. Anyway, I'm the one who's been saying that Kennedy is a beast. I'm the one who's been talking about him being awesome. And a lot of people simply have not believed in him. He won on a three fight tear after that split decision that he lost. And he was playable in essentially all of those spots and nobody wanted to trust him. I mean, I, I called the finish over Kutalaba. I called the, uh, the submission that he hit on, um, Clark. Oh, who, who, who was that? Devin Clark. Devin Clark. Thank you. Yep. Called the sub on Devin Clark when he pulled that move. I mean, everything's been, um, turning up gravy for me here with Kennedy, but then we pumped the brakes against Dustin Jacoby because guess what? This man is chinny. Wheezy, he was. I said in every single podcast breakdown I've done for Kennedy, he is low key chinny. He ain't low key chinny anymore, Wheezy. He is now high key chinny. Everybody knows he's chinny. He's been dropped, he's been rocked, he's been hurt, he's been cracked so many times. We all know it now. And usually he goes full Homer Simpson, covers up, protects that jaw, and once you've got him hurt he waits for you to kind of expose yourself and then he turns the tables. He's yeah. very good at finding openings. He's got those long hands, those long arms. He loops around your guard with the punches, good uppercuts, long jab. Like he knows how to use that lengthy frame really well. And then, like I mentioned, the submission game is coming along as well. He trains with Ryan Spann. He's got a sick guillotine on him after working with that guy. And he goes to work with that pretty regularly. I like everything about Kennedy except that durability and the fact that he has to come from the dead in almost every single fight, even against poor fighters who shouldn't be hurting you on the feet, like a Devin Clark. Guys like Dustin Jacoby flatline this dude, and he's a decision fighter. Like, you cannot trust the chin of this man. Minus 500 in this economy, Weezy? <laughs> like... I know OSP is dust. I know this man has been walking dead. He's been zombie for three years straight now. Like he should have hung it up a long time ago. And he just got deaded by Felipe Linz in the very first round in his last fight. And it was ugly, Wheezy. He used to be light on his feet. He used to have a nice kicking game. He used to control the range. And then once you made a mistake, get on top of you and hit you with the Von Prue trope and just bully you with his size and, he doesn't do any of that shit anymore. Man, you go back and you watch that Mauricio Shogun Hua fight. I saw that fight in person, Wheezy. I wanted it to be over so bad. Like, they just stood at range and, like, just outside of range kind of flicked stuff at each other. It was like, if you promise not to hit me, I promise not to hit you. Like, that's what OSP is doing at this point. He doesn't want to get touched. Yeah, it's probably Kennedy inside the distance, Wheezy. It's probably Kennedy by KO. He's so much younger. He's faster. He hits harder. But by God, OSP just has to touch him once. Like, the, this is a guy who doesn't look out of place at heavyweight. I know it's been years and everyone's going to bring it up, but the John Jones fight where he took a, a puffed up steroided John Jones to the limit back in the day, like, he's never been a bad fighter. Yes, he's old now. Yes, he's fragile now. But Kennedy is young and fragile, and his chin is exposed, and he's been hit so many times. Mushroom calling for the OSP round one KO. I can't do it, but I see it. I get it. I think Kennedy's going to finish the old man, Wheezy. It's a bounce-back spot for him. That's what they want, obviously. They're trying to get the kid a good notable name on his record and keep him moving in the right direction. Yeah. But I am laying nowhere near this price tag on Kennedy. If you want to play Kennedy and bring that number down, at least play him inside the distance or something. Like, don't risk so much. I see a lot of people parlaying him, and I could never. I've made some risky ass parlays in my day, Wheezy. I am not parlaying Kennedy and Chuku at this point in his life. Uh, what do you like in this fight? Yeah, so I have a confession to make, right? Um, but most people already know that I've done this, but I'm just going to say it because this is how we get better in life, you know? I max bet Kennedy and Chekwu versus Dustin Jacoby. Oh my goodness. Five units, you know? And and the, the stoppage was absolute dog shit. I mean, like he he was fine. He was completely covered up. Actually, Dustin Jacoby landed zero ground strikes, but yeah, Gary Copeland stopped the fight anyway. And and I see why he did. 
Kennedy got dropped out. He got put flat on his ass, you know, and mm-hmm. and then he covered up while Dustin was landing shots to his forearm. He was fine. Fight shouldn't have been stopped, but you're going to get fights stopped when you get planted flat on your ass and then cover up. So I can't be mad about how that fight ended because this is how Kennedy loses fights. He's going to get sparked early. Yep. But if you don't get a, if you don't get this guy out of there in like three or four minutes, you're fucked. I don't care. Like a guy like Nicolay Nega Mariano, who's got a head like an Easter Island statue, and then you can hit him across the head with a two <laughs> I love by that four. Guy. Yeah, I do too, dude. I mean, I don't even know how he stands up. That's the one guy I've seen where his his ears go past his shoulders. You know, like he he's he's got the biggest head I've ever seen, and you're not knocking that guy out. I don't know how Ulberg knocked him out. That was a freak thing, but either way, you're not knocking that guy out. But I mean. I think Kennedy's going to destroy this dude, absolutely dismantle him. But can I put real money on him knowing that he's going to pressure right off the bat? He's going to force the fight. Ovens doesn't do shit. Not even a little. I was saying on stat diggers, this guy looks like he's drinking cough syrup, you know, backstage with little Wayne before he goes out there to fight. 7.8 distance strike attempts per minute, 2.12 less than the divisional average. 0.94 0.94 takedowns per 15 minutes. And this is a guy who's a good wrestler, you know? He doesn't do anything. But somehow, somehow, Ovin St. Pru in his 14 UFC wins has finished 11 of them. Not doing shit. He finds three Von, Von Pru chokes. He knocks out guys with a straight left hand every once in a while. He just kind of waits he finds a moment, and that's a very dangerous fighter against somebody like Kennedy and Chek, who, you know, like he, that Alberg fight, he took so much damage in the first round. He persevered through it. He won, and then he gets knocked out by a forearm to the elbow against against Da Eun Jung in the very next fight. When I was saying, like, that was scary. oh, my God, this guy's crazy durable. You're not getting him out of there, and he's got great conditioning. He's got great output. He's got great pressure. You know, if you don't get him out of there early, this guy's going to melt you. And those knees that he was landing against Kudalaba, he's throwing them like uppercuts. You know, like he can reach your he can reach your chin with his knee. That's how tall he is. He's six foot three, six foot five with an 83 inch reach. You know, he can do things that you, you can't teach height. You can't teach length. You can't teach having that. How does he make 205? This guy's got to walk around at 240. If I mean, like, at six foot five, dude, I'm six foot three. I weigh 235 on a good day, you know, <laughs> and I am not built like Kennedy and Chekwu. This guy's two inches taller than me. He's, he's a monster. Right down at 205. I don't know how he does it, dude. I mean, like, if you were to put my hand up against that guy's hand, his fingers would be up here, you know. I mean, I don't know how he makes 205. He's going to destroy this 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 St. Pru dude. He's going to come out there looking like he drank cough syrup. He's going to be slow. He's going to be waiting to land one big shot. He probably isn't. Kennedy's going to pressure him, wear him down, and finish him, I think, beginning of second round, end of the first. Okay. Yeah, Weezy, I am absolutely with you, man. It's one of those things where oh, I just uh, – I'm not betting It's so it, hard though. to trust him at this number. No, He's man, not win. at minus 500. He's going to win, but it's so hard to trust him at this number. All right, let's move on, though. Next up, we have got Brian Battle taking on Ange Lusa in what should actually kind of shape up to be a real interesting fight. You know, you mentioned off the top that this is good matchmaking. This is really good matchmaking. Yeah. It doesn't sound like much, but this is a fun fight, man. Brian Battle, ultimate fighter winner, 10 and 2. And I'll say it again, Weezy. I have no idea how he makes 170. This guy's body is built for 185 pounds. And instead of stacking muscle on it and, and being up there where he should be, he's instead decided to live on a diet of peas and carrots. And he sucks himself down to 170 pounds every single fight. I, I have no idea how. I really don't know. And it's scary because you look at him on the scales, like when he weighs in, and you can see his torso. You can yeah. see his rib cage. Like you can see the frame of his body where his skin is just sagging off of it. And you're like, that ain't right, man. Like, He's so big, he should be a 185-er. I don't know how he does it. The one thing I will give Brian Battle credit for, though, he's got a badass Shinron tattoo, man. It's like all the way down his back and like wraps around his arm. R.I.P. 
Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball Z, died this past week. Very sad. My favorite show growing up as a kid. Still love Dragon Ball Z at Bridge these days. Um, big sad. Big sad there for me. Uh, but no answer for wrestling. Brian Battle against Renat Fakhradinov. Man, he got taken down over and over and over again. Just can't he can't handle these guys that can chain grapple on people. He is an opportunistic finisher. He has nasty submissions on him. He's a bit of a size bully. A lot of a size bully, actually, now that I say that. He hits very hard at 170 pounds. He's got good range control with the front kicks. I like his overall game. But because of that weight cut, man, he does actually kind of tend to be a little slow. Like, he's got to hit you with a big shot from outside. He's got to catch you with a choke when he can. Like, I was really impressed with his fight against AJ Fletcher because that fight went exactly the opposite of what absolutely everybody thought. We all thought Fletcher was going to have the grappling advantage and Brian Battle was going to need to keep the fight standing and strike. But AJ came out and said, nah, bro, I'm flipping the tables. And he actually hurt Brian Battle on the feet. He was the one winning the striking battle in that fight. And Battle said, okay, bet. And so he took the grappler down and somehow flipped the tables again. Like, it was a real awesome, like, high-level big brain moment for Brian Battle to find an avenue of victory where he was really struggling and almost finished in that fight. It was real fun to watch, but... I got to credit him for the in-fight adjustment. That's some real high-level stuff. Battle's going to have a three-inch reach advantage here in this spot. He's got a horrific 45% takedown defense rating, which is not good. Wheezy, I like it when people are above the 70% mark. If I can yeah. count on someone's takedown defense, it's got to be 70 or higher. If you're under that 70 mark, unless there's something weird like you fought a JSP where he got, you know, down 12 times in the course of a fight and it ruined your numbers, that kind of thing. It's unforgivable. Ange Lusa, 10 and 3, 29 years old. He's fighting out of Kill Cliff FC. And this guy has a room full of killers to work with. He's in there working with Usman, Gilbert Burns, Hobo Cop. He's in there with uh, Jason Jackson, the ass kicking machine, Bellator champion. Like this guy is surrounded by talent and he's getting better. Uh, he finally broke his uh, every other fight win uh, thing that he was doing. He was doing win-loss, win-loss, alternating. And then they gave him Reese McKee, and he beat the brakes off of Reese McKee, Wheezy. It was a little a little uncomfortable. Like, we saw what Hamzat did to Reese, and he came back, and everyone was all excited. And then Lusa was like, nah, I'm going to punch him in the mouth. And he really messed that kid up again. He is short. He's extremely thick. He's got all kinds of muscle on that frame, and he blasts big, powerful punches. He's got a real powerful, stiff jab, and he attacks people like a dog on a bone. Like He had Reese McKee's face busted up early in round one. I think he was convinced he was going to get the round one finish, Wheezy, because usually Ange paces himself a little bit better than that, and he really went for broke in that first round. Thankfully, Reese was a little bit too gun-shy, to like come after him after he needed to catch his breath for a second and he caught a second wind and then proceeded to beat the brakes off of Reese McKee yet again. Um, extremely durable three losses by decision and he lost to Jack Della on Dana White's contender series. So that's the kind of spot where you're like, man, that guy just finished Gilbert Burns. He's in the top five now. Yeah. Like he's, that's not a bad guy to lose to on Dana White's contender series. I'm, br I'm glad on Lusa found his way into the UFC because I, I think that's fair. You know what I mean? Um, I, I like this guy. I really do. And, and I feel like we've got some opportunity to maybe back him in spots where it's a little bit sneaky. And Weezy, this might be one of those spots. You know, you go back and you watch when Lusa fought Fletcher. And I know, you know MMA math never works, right? Both these guys have a win over Fletcher. But that mm -hmm. was that elevation fight where everyone was gassing out left and right. Everyone was just dying because they couldn't keep their air. And Ange Lusa was the one guy that redlined and just mentally pushed through. He was like, no, I know I'm tired. I'm going to get on top of this guy. I know I'm tired. I'm going to hit you. And he won that fight just by being tougher, just by being the one guy who was willing to dig deep and in a very bad position, mind you, in a spot where he was behind. Like That, that, that fight spoke volumes to me. Honestly, I've seen Brian Battle get cracked one too many times, and I've seen him get hurt at 170, one too many times and the fact that you can't finish lusa you can hit him in the face yeah. with a two by four and he will eat it and keep coming forward i think this is exactly the kind of guy that can do what uh what fletcher was trying to do to brian battle except be successful at it i don't think brian battle is going to get takedowns 
on Ange Lusa the way he did against Fletcher. I don't think that Brian Battle is going to be able to take the heat from Ange Lusa the way he was able to against Fletcher. And I don't think he's going to have a comeback submission in him the way he did against Fletcher. Wheezy, this is AJ Fletcher plus. Like, Lusa is exactly the type of guy that threatens the same things that were working against Brian Battle. He just does them all better. I like Ange Lusa in this fight, man. I, I, we've got Brian Battle as a minus 165 underdog. You can get plus 140 on Lusa. And I'm going dog hunting this week, Wheezy. I think I like Ange Lusa in this spot. So I bet against Lusa in the McKee fight. And I knew that McKee had no chance to finish on Galusa because pretty much nobody has a chance to finish that dude. But, um, man, he almost finished him. Reese McKee almost finished Angalusa at the end of that fight. Very... Very Lusa spent everything trying to get Reese out of there, and somehow he didn't die. And and then and then Anga didn't die and was literally running yeah. away and getting hit in the back of the head. He was there are some referees that might have stopped dangerous. because Angalusa was turning his back on Reese McKee, who was actually putting it on him at the end of the third round. And the reason I bet Reese McKee in that fight was I didn't foresee. Angelusa getting takedowns and winning minutes that way. I kind of felt like if Reese stayed on the feet, Reese throws a ton of volume. Reese brings a ton of pressure. And that's a very difficult stylistic matchup to deal with. But here's the thing Brian Battle is a better striker than Reese McKee is. And even though Angelusa got takedowns against Reese McKee, I don't know if he's going to be able to get them against Brian Battle. Most of those takedowns against Battle came in the Fakhradinov fight. Angelusa is not Renat Fakhradinov when it comes to the wrestling. No. Here's no. the other thing. You talk about minute winning in the distance striking battles. Angelusa, negative 1.9 distance striking differential. Brian Battle, Positive 3.94 distance striking differential. While these fights are at range, Angelusa is getting outstruck by two strikes per minute by his opponents. Brian Battle is outstriking his opponents at distance by four strikes per minute. So this guy is doing an excellent job at distance striking range of winning minutes. So if Angelusa isn't taking down Brian Battle, I don't think he's winning minutes in this fight. That's the problem here. Angelusa is not getting finished by anybody, though. I mean, that is not going to happen. This dude is next level durable. If you're getting hit with Jack Della Maddalena's best shots and walking through them, Brian Battle is probably not finishing you. Okay. So I think that this fight's going to go the distance. I kind of like fight goes to decision here. And I do believe that this is going to be a good fight and that Angelus is probably going to get a couple of takedowns and win some minutes on the ground. But Brian Battle has been on, in there against 185ers like Andre Petrovsky with really good grappling games. And while yeah. you're taking him down early, unless you're a guy like Renat who could push that pace for a full 15 minutes, you're probably not keeping him down. And, and even if you do, you're going to have to deal with some submission attempts. Brian Battles, 5-1 and one to the submission in his career, while Angelusa's 1-0, and oh, okay? So I think this Brian... This got no might... neck, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I don't know if... I mean, like, I don't know if that guy needs to breathe in order to walk either because he's been put in some really bad spots and, and persevered through them. So I think this is a great fight. I'm picking Brian Battle to win by decision because I love that minute winning ability it is on the feet at distance striking range. I don't mind that, Wheezy. And over may not be such a bad thing here. Uh, the one thing that worries me, like I said, though, is that Fletcher found the sweet spot and cracked Battle and dropped him to a knee in that spot. I think Anj hits harder than Fletcher does. If if Fletcher's able to clip him like that, I could see uh Ange Lusa knocking him out but uh, I lean towards the over uh, you know battle's got the submission upside you've got Ange Lusa who could get a KO and at the end of the day these probably are just going to go back and forth and beat the hell out of each other until we get a 15 minute decision and yeah. one of them gets uh robbed <laughs> according to MMA Twitter it'll be a fun fight man it's going to be a good back and forth battle for your co-main event yeah the fight goes to decision is minus 200 though so the books are definitely wow. on 
to Angelus's durability here. And uh, so I'm not going to get to it at minus 200. No way. Not Me the way either. that these guys hit. They're both no discounts really given finishers. there. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. So that we got to be careful about, you know, even though I think it's going to decision, maybe we'll get a better deal on a Lusa or a battle by decision prop because those, those, uh, those fight doesn't go to decision or juiced up. So maybe yeah. battle by decision, you can get them at a much better price in the money line. And the same thing for Lusa. Maybe so. Maybe so. All right, everybody. Main event time. Taito Avasa takes on Marcin Taibora and Weezy, I'm just sick. I'm just a little bit sick in this one, man. I, I went against my guy, the seven-unit bet king himself, Alexander Volkov. I bet five units max underdog play on tie to Ivasa. And my own guy made me pay because I doubted him against Tai to Ivasa. Bad times. Bad times for your boy. Lost a pile there in that spot. Not good. Not good. Um and I've got a little bit of a raw taste in my mouth. You know, Tai Tuavas is on a bit of a losing streak at this point in his career, but this screams at me like a bounce back spot. Now, I thought it was a bounce back spot last time. And if I'm willing to bet Ty against Volkov, again, I probably should be betting Ty against Marcin Taibura. But Taibura is kind of that gatekeeper guy at this weight class that definitely shows up when he's not supposed to. And if you're not there, man, if you're not really in the top eight or something, Marcin Tybura is going to show you the door. He gives that veteran lesson to everybody. He knows how to pace himself. He's got you know, those chin issues yeah. that plagued him early on in his career. They seem to have kind of dissipated. He seems to fight a lot smarter. Seems like he's lost a little bit of uh, weight, so he's in better shape. He doesn't get hurt as easily. He's got good defense. He's a BJJ black belt. He knows how to wrestle when he needs to. Like Tybura just does everything so well. And it's something that, frankly, I have discounted you know that's that's something that i haven't recognized quickly enough in my mma handicapping i kept trying to fade this guy i thought the chin issues were going to be a thing that plagued him always and he's not just a pushover he's not a guy that's just easy to get out of there and it's cost me um i i do think that tai Avasa can get himself in a good spot in this one i think the leg kicks will work real well i think if anyone's going to knock out marcin again it's a guy that's got this you know quick twitch muscle the speed of tai Avasa, and can get him out of there but it's so hard to trust this guy to fight to any kind of a game plan because he really just brawls. You know, he doesn't prep at all. He goes in there to have a good time. He wants to do a shoey. The UFC likes him. He's a personality. And I think because of that, they're going to give him good fights that he can win. And that's what we've got here in this spot. But he's also not the guy I can trust to have the best game plan going in. He's not the guy I can trust to have the best camp going in. And, you know, those are the types of things. Tua Vasa could drink six beers the night before the fight. You don't know. Like, he's that kind of guy. He's just going to go in there and fight so it's tough to trust him minus 125 minus 130 i'm gonna pick taitu avasa i do think he gets back on track i do think he knocks out marcin taibura in this five round fight spot because he, as much as he can be taken down he's got decent cardio and he could get up and he could hurt this guy deeper in the fight if you know Tabura slows down just a little bit ty's gonna keep throwing so i think the ko is there um, but it's not my most confident take in the world, Wheezy. I, I would not be shocked if Marcin Taibura just kind of keeps things going and Tuivasa maybe has the win taken out of his sails now that he's made some money, now that he's got a couple of side hustles. You know, he's not the hungry guy that first got to the UFC. He might just take a couple paychecks, and that kind of scares me in this spot. I know it's a lot of narrative, but it really does worry me the mentality of this guy coming into this fight, and, and that's what's kind of keeping me off him at this point. Yeah, and it's always... It's a little bit scary to bet Australian dudes fighting in the UFC. If you know anything that too. about what that flight is like, I mean, it's it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. You know, I mean, uh, flying from the United States to Australia is the worst because you're going back in time. You're not going forward in time. For some reason, when you take long flights, it's a little bit easier to go west than it is to go east. So, you know, maybe it's a little bit better for these guys, but come on, man. I mean, you see Tyson Pedro last week? That didn't look good. You know, I mean, these guys that come from Australia to fight, you know, it's 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 not something that looks good a lot of the time. Jack that Jack got it done, but I know he got here early as well. And with this fight, you know, it's so easy to find paths of victory for both guys. I mean, obviously, Tai Tuivasa, he lands a big shot on the feet, knocks out Tabura. It's happened before. But if Tabura gets the takedowns and gets the top control and gets to a dominant position, he's gonna make Ty look like an amateur on the mat, and he's done it before. Um, Marcin, yeah, dude, his ground and pound is really good. Marcin Tabura, he doesn't even, he's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, but he doesn't use it. He, he'd rather pound you out and he's got excellent ground and pound. So 
Um, this is a fight that, while it's a fun main event, it's going to be a great fight. I have no urges to gamble on this fight. Like the fight doesn't go to decision. Minus fourteen hundred. What the fuck oh am I God. supposed to do with minus fourteen hundred? Am I going to parlay that and get it down to minus twelve hundred? Come on, you know. So I mean, like, uh, am I betting fight goes at plus seven hundred? No, you know <laughs> that's not happening either. I know how Tui Vasa wins. I know how Tabura wins. And I think that the books have it right in that it's about a coin flip. So I'm completely fine staying away from this fight. It's a sloppy heavyweight fight. I'm going to pick Tabura because I think that Tabura can win minutes at distance striking range. But there's no way that Ty's ever winning minutes in the grappling exchanges against Marson. So uh, yeah. Marson's got the experience advantage. He's got a few more UFC fights. Um, his wins and, and overall competition is comparable with Tai Tuivasa's. But the one thing that Marson has done at distance is win minutes, but we've never really seen Ty have any success in the grappling exchanges. So I'll lean Marson here, uh, lean with the experience, with the more uh, tested game and the more uh, well-rounded attack. But, you know, I mean, either one of these guys can win this fight, and I think it happens inside the distance. But I'm not laying 14 units to win one. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's a stay away, man. It's going to be a fun main event, though. I mean, what what would it take you to bet Marcin Tybura by decision, Weezy? What would that? What would Ooh. it take? Man, like that would have to be like in the neighborhood of plus a thousand. Before I was like, I could put a quarter unit on this and win two point five. But like, kind of what he does, <laughs> and it might even be close to that. I mean, if it's minus fourteen hundred for fight goes, let's see where Bet Online has that. Yeah, that picking one of these guys with a fourteen to or a ten to one just for it to go the distance, that should be a pretty penny. Yeah. So, um, Tui Vasa by decision is plus nine twenty five, and Tabura by decision is plus a thousand. So I actually yeah. called it. It's actually plus one. a thousand. So maybe I'll have to put a quarter unit. <laughs> On Marcin Tabura to win by, but I don't think I'm doing that, man. I'm no, going to enjoy no. this fight. It's a fun fight. We, you know, they have to make lines. We don't have to bet it. And this is when I'm not going to be betting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, thank you so much, Wheezy, for being here with me tonight, everybody. That's UFC Vegas 88. We spent way longer than we meant to. The show usually is between like, an hour 40 and like just about two hours. I try to cap it off at two hours, but Weezy and I were having a little bit to drink. The chat was having a little bit of fun. We were hanging out. It was a good time. And I want you to show Weezy some love for hanging out with us this long here on the show, my guy. Thank you so much, Weezy, for hanging out with us on the pod. Shout the people out. Let them know where they can find you, how they can support you, and what kind of content you've got coming up. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Clint. It's good to be on the new Home of Fight channel here. I really wish you luck over here. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic with the fantastic people you have, like Maddie Betts, Derek Brunson, Gilbert Burns, backing you I'm on excited. this great new site. So congratulations on the big move over here. I'm envious of you and the success that you've had in this business. And the reason that you're successful is because you're a good human being. You do a great show, and you you provide really good entertainment for your fans and that's always what i've wanted to do as well so Thank you, Weezy. um yeah that. man you can find me on my youtube channel uncle wheezy you can find me on pub sports radio i have a patreon package where i uh, provide analytics and statistics to the mma gambling community so that we can all be better gamblers together by having all the information at our fingertips when we make our bets so I do prop templates. I do betting templates. I do side-by-side uh, -side matchup statistics. And I've even stepped into the significant strike, takedown, and fantasy score prop markets. Beautiful. I play DFS. I do everything is just MMA for me. I don't bet on football. I don't bet on basketball. I don't bet on hockey. I don't bet on curling or on you know any of these other niche sports. And no, no Danish handball. You know, none of that stuff for me. It is all MMA. So you can find me on YouTube at my YouTube, uh, at my YouTube channel. You can find me on Pub Sports Radio. You can find me doing stat diggers every 615 on Pub Sports with my guy DFS by the numbers. I'm looking forward to these fights, and I hope that we all stack cash tickets like flapjacks on UFC Vegas 88, Clint. Hell yeah, Weezy. We're going to make some money this week. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for getting us that 100 likes so we could do some extra shots there for you guys. We'll be back this week for the Total Takedown Thursday, the undefeated post-weigh-in show Friday. And uh, 
you guys, I'm just having fun. I'm having a good time. We're swinging from the rafters a little more than I would like, so we're going to try and put a little bit of a lid on it, get some uh, get some winning mojo here going. I think we got a couple of good cards coming up, and UFC 300 is right around the corner. Yeah. Try not to blow your bankroll before we get to that point because there's going to be some opportunities coming down the pipe. And then one more thing I want to let you guys know, those of you who entered in the Bet Openly gauntlet with me on Twitter this couple weeks ago, we did a six-week betting challenge with $600 in giveaway prizes with our sponsor, Bet Openly. They gave away 600 bucks for you guys to play a little stupid game with me on Twitter. We're going to run it back. Starting at UFC 300, we're going to do the gauntlet too. So if you guys want an opportunity at big prizes with a fun contest that we're going to run for free, all you got to do is sign up and put 50 bucks on Bet Openly. It's a $50 bankroll challenge. So it's not even an entry fee. It's a bankroll challenge. So there's a chance you can come out of there smelling like roses. A couple people made a few hundred bucks just with their betting and then also won prize money when they got in those top three slots. So we're going to do that again. Big shout out to our guy Gino for letting us do those kind of con cool contests with big cash prizes for people. So make sure you get on Bet Openly, get signed up. I'll put the link in the description below. Please join the Discord. Join us here at the home of fight. And if you're still with me, I need my diehards. I need my people, especially my audio people. We're going to start uploading the audio version of the podcast to the home of fight Spotify. Now I'm going to keep putting it on the diehard channel for you guys. I'm not going to mess you up. I know that's where you go. It's already set up. It's easy peasy, but it's going to help me out a ton if the home of fight sees the love from the diehard community here, if you guys can subscribe to the home of fight Spotify for me, and then just turn those little downloads on. I know you're going to get the podcast twice in your feed. You can just delete one of them. It's not going to hurt you. It takes two seconds. It's free. Please get those download numbers up for me here on home of fight. It's going to help me out a ton. Appreciate you guys love the crap out of each and every one of you. If it wasn't for you guys being here, we wouldn't be doing this show still five years later, five years. Can you believe it? Weezy? We I are on an absolute roll. We're on a mission. We're going to keep going. Diehard MMA podcast to the moon. Hundred years, hundred years. Diehard MMA podcast. Love you guys. Get out of here. Make some money. Let's freaking roll. And I'm missing the button here because something went haywire and my mouse. Dear God, no. What? We, you can't see the mouse cursor, Wheezy. So like I'm trying to click oh, the no. stream button and I'm like, <laughs> I'm just like trying to wiggle to where I see like an area of my screen light up because I can't. Okay, wait a sec. I'm close. I'm close. There it goes. Almost. There we go. Got it. Got it. Thank you guys.